Hi, Sweeney. It's Alex. Hi, Alex. Hi there. Are they still in? Must they must still be in closed session? Yes. Uh, no, uh, they're just taking a little break. They should be joining soon. We start oh. regular session at seven ten. Okay. I'm going to put myself on mute. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Share screen. Recording. Okay, great. I'm looking at the uh, participants list and I do see one, two, three, four, five of us council members and city attorney and city manager. Okay. I think we got enough uh, to get started here. And so we are broadcasting live on YouTube and Facebook uh, on the World Wide Web. Thanks for tuning in, folks, on uh, this Tuesday night here in a, on a beautiful June day, if I may say. I hope everybody had an opportunity to uh, spend a little time outside uh, before a busy night of business. Uh, we just came out of a virtual closed session, and we'll... Resume uh, our uh, public meeting okay. here, and we'll go to our city attorney, Christopher Diaz, for any announcements from the closed session. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just wanted to note that uh, direction was given to staff, but there's nothing uh, legally required to be reported out of closed session this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And moving on here, the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, and so I believe our city manager has the uh, function for the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'll ask everybody to stand up and we'll go ahead and um, recite our pledge. Thank you, Mary. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, the United States of, America, of America, 
and to the republic to the republic for which it stands for which it stands one nation one nation under god under god indivisible indivisible with liberty with and liberty justice for all justice for all thank you very much uh mr city manager and we will now go to our invocation and according to the agenda uh, it will be presented this evening by council member fan i um want to ask uh if my um, esteemed colleague uh, vice mayor nunez uh, would do me the honors as uh, he is um much um better versed at, at this than i am sure Yes, I would. Thank you very much. If you all take a moment. These past few months have been pressing on all of us. Some of us have lost loved ones. All of us have been taken on jobs that we are not used to, uh, have been displaced have reached out to help others in ways that we've not been called upon in the past. At the end of the day, what we've been asked to do is care. And we all know how to do that in our many different ways. One is in the selected body that we all serve. But every day we are asked to care for those that don't have the same that they had just weeks or months ago. Let us continue to do that as long as COVID is here and it presses upon all of us to remember that we can all reach out and help others that have far less than we do and need all of our help. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Mayor, uh, for the invocation this uh, evening, uh, certainly. Powerful, okay. Next up here is the public forum. Uh, those interested may address city council on any subject not on tonight's agenda. Comments must be submitted in writing on the form available online has been our uh, protocol for the last um, few months. Uh, those commenting may provide their name and city of residence for the city clerk's record, that's Mary Laville, and limit remarks to be read aloud by the city clerk to um, three minutes or less. Um, as an item not listed on the agenda, no response is required from city staff or the council and no action can be taken. Council may instruct the city manager, Stephen Kirst, to place the item on a future meeting agenda. Um, so we'll go to our city clerk, Mary Lavelle, for our uh, comments tonight. Sure, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to let the council know there are about 30 comments so far that have come into the mailbox. I'll be sharing the duty of reading these with the Deputy City Clerk, Pam. So when I get a little tired or need water, I'll turn to Pam to read for you. All right. The first comment you have is from Voltaire Montemayor, 669 Penitentia Street. The mayor, vice mayor, members of the city council, city manager and staff. In my judgment, the world is bound to confront sides of risks, mainly one, the worldwide health crisis, two, worldwide economy downfall and other direct effects in our citizens' livelihood. We should carefully, sanitarily, efficiently consume our remaining momentum to go back to normal work. We will be favoring all to revive the economy, boredom and anxiety of people, although great or just good inward push whole world to Milpitas is a bigger clicking frame and outward encouragement from Milpitas to pilot the whole world is small but terrible. Thank you. Next comment is from Nick Belaski, 25 Tyler Court, Hollister, California. Dear city council and residents of the beautiful city of Milpitas, we have all had our world turned upside down in these last few months in a time where hard lines have been drawn in our world, asking people to make a choice on where they stand. I myself choose peace and unity. Some might say that it is impossible to achieve it, but that does not change my stance. As a pastor who has been blessed to be a part of this beautiful city called Milpitas, 
I vow to do what I can to bring about peace and unity. We are blessed to have one of the greatest first responder teams in California. Our police officers are prompt, professional, and fair. This is a reflection of our great chief, Armando Corpus. I have had interactions with Milpitas PD. I also consider Chief Armando a friend. Our men in blue work hard to keep our city safe. I pray let us never forget that. With all the talks of defunding the police, let us not be influenced by the actions of others. I stand with our police officers. I stand with our community. I stand to bring about peace and unity. Matthew 7, 12. So in everything do unto others what you would have them do unto you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Let's bring peace and unity together. Next one is from Vincent Academia, 1839 Dalton Drive, Milpitas. Hello, Mayor Tran, Vice Mayor Nunez, and Council Members Dominguez, Fan, and Montano. My name is Vincent Academia Jr., resident of Milpitas and member of the NAACP Youth Council. My comment is in regards to the number of police officers assigned to patrol and why it took three patrol cars to ask for my ID and what I was doing while waiting in my car to pick up my friend in 2018. As stated in city budget, 5371 officers are assigned to patrol a number that seems excessive when Milpitas is a relatively safe city. Patrolling is precisely when racial profiling occurs. Therefore, reducing the number of patrol officers would lead to less racial profiling. I believe it was racial profiling in excessive patrol officers that led to me being harassed by three officers in patrol cars. I was parked on Manford waiting for my friend. When the first officer pulled up, I told my friend to stay inside in case it would prevent him from getting his green card. Without calling for backup, a couple more patrol cars pulled up. I did not know my rights and they made me get out of my car, empty my pockets, searched me and told me to sit on the hood of their car while they threw everything around searching my vehicle. They found nothing and only succeeded in wasting my time because I had never had anything illegal on me to begin with. Reduce the number of patrol officers and prevent future incidents like these from occurring. Next is from Ting Na Zhu, Hillcrest Terrace, Milpitas. Dear Milpitas City Council members, my name is Tina. My family and I strongly oppose the Police Oversight Committee and fully support Milpitas Police Department. We are proud of the Milpitas Police. In many cases, they arrived the location very fast. My friend's daughter was saved in one case. Our policemen are nice and caring. They really try their best to do the job. We are Milpitas families. We should support each other. Thank you. Next is from Feng Kui, 1695 Arizona Ave, Milpitas. Dear Milpitas City Council members, my name is Feng Kui. My family and I strongly oppose the Police Oversight Committee and fully support Milpitas Police Department. Number one, our officers do an excellent job. Yes, they sometimes make mistakes as in any large organization, but we are the Milpitas Police Department, not Minneapolis or San Jose. Historically, number two, historically the majority of our police chiefs have been people of color since the inception of our department. Number three, since 2000 or near then, our command staff has always been staffed with a majority of people of color. Under our last police chief, 100% of the command staff were people of color. Under Chief Corpus, all but one is a person of color. Number four, our department hired the first ever sick officer and had to petition the state to have uniform regulations changed in order to do so. Our department supports people of color, the LGBTQ community and all religions. In fact, the past two presidents of our police officers union were gay, one male, one female. Number five, Milpitas police use community policing, thus they are familiar with our neighborhoods. Our officers reach out to people, especially children in the neighborhoods, and our officers' reputations in the community is excellent. Six, NAACP believes that an oversight committee should be in place just in case something happens. There is already process in place that works. If the police chief cannot resolve a complaint, the citizen can appeal to the city manager or city council. Next. 
from Ki Hong Nian, 1030 Hamilton Ave, Milpitas. Dear Milpitas City Council members, my name is Ki Hong Nian. My family and I strongly oppose the Police Oversight Committee and fully support Milpitas Police Department. Number one, our officers do an excellent job. Yes, they sometimes make mistakes as in any large organization, but we are the Milpitas Police Department, not Minneapolis or San Jose. Number two, historically, the majority of our police chiefs have been people of color since the inception of our department. Number three, since 2000 or near then, our command staff has always been staffed with a majority of people of color. Under our last police chief, 100% of the command staff were people of color. Under Chief Corpus, all but one is a person of color. Number four, our department hired the first ever sick officer and had to petition the state to have uniform regulations changed in order to do so. Our department supports people of color, the LGBTQ community and all religions. In fact, the past two presidents of our police officers union were gay, one male, one female. Number five, Milpitas police use community policing. Thus, they are familiar with our neighborhoods. Our officers reach out to people, especially children in the neighborhoods and our officers reputation in the community is excellent. Number six, NAACP believes that an oversight committee should be in place just in case something happens. There is already process in place that works. If the police chief cannot resolve a complaint, the citizen can appeal to the city manager or city council. Next, from Anna Nar Naranjo, 1828 Canton Drive. Dear Mayor Chan and city council, our families are now more unprotected than ever. We need to work to be able to live daily, but now we don't have any resources to survive. The economic crisis was already affecting us, but now it is distressing and inhuman. Consider that not all families have immigration status and can receive government help, but they also count as human beings who need your help in the fiscal budget. Do not leave us families who are less than low income. Now is the time to help all of you work together, our leaders see the needs of the people and our generation and future generations live in peace in their homes, knowing that you were there when they were most needed, leaving an example of union, faith and hope. I hope can consider us into the fiscal budget. Thank you, Anna Naranjo. Next from Sherlyn Wong. Milpitas police use community policing, thus they are familiar with our neighborhoods. Our officers reach out to people, especially children in the neighborhoods and our officers reputation in the community is excellent. Next, Keith Brown, South, Victoria, South Park, Victoria Drive. I am appalled by Carmen Montano's recent comments calling protesters quote hoodlums and quote criminals. Do black lives not matter to her? Can I make a comment on that? Can, yeah. I, can I make a comment on that? I don't understand. Uh, I don't. I do not appreciate someone uh, distorting my name and making false accus accusations. I never said that. That is so wrong. And 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 please, the name of the person who said that. Thank you. Next, from Miguel Lopez, the city should get rid of the racist Minuteman image. Look up the Minuteman project. They are- uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Can you uh, just for my reference or the public's reference, who was that last email from that referred to? The previous uh, one that I'm reading, the previous one is from someone called Keith Brown, South Park, Victoria Drive. Okay, thank you. Thank All right. You. I'm gonna return now to a comment I was reading from Miguel yes. Lopez. He asked the council to look up the Minuteman project. They are an anti-immigrant and anti-Mexican and operate under the guise of being a civilian watch group at the US-Mexico border. They still exist today. I know that this was probably not what the city had in mind when it chose this to be our symbol, but a Minuteman is a Minuteman. Next is from Giselle Hernandez. Minuteman is racist and not represent my community. Get rid of Minuteman, please. Next from Warren Brown. We need to implement police reforms now also. Do black lives not matter to council member Montano? How is it that the mayor and the rest of the city council has taken a knee in solidarity with those of us fed up 
with systemic racism, yet she stayed home in silence. She claims she's from Sunny Hills, yet her mindset is no different from white America. Shameful. Who was that from? Uh... <laughs> And I want to make, uh, who's that from? Because they don't know that I injured, I have an injured a ankle and uh, for them to distort that as well. Uh, please give me their name. Warren Brown is the last comment that I read okay. from. The next comment is from T. Vaughn Jackson. Carmen Montano is racist for calling protesters criminals. You've got black kids being hunted down like sport in America, and you call us criminals when we finally snap. Until justice is served, there can be no peace. Shame on you. First of all, I don't know who's spreading those lies, but that's defamation of character and slanderous. So um, uh, please keep uh, please keep track of all the names, please. Yes, yes, and we'll provide that to uh, Councilmember Montano. I, I, I want to make sure that uh, we are not as a community uh, putting forward any false accusations, unfounded claims, I, we'll, we'll carry on with the public forum. And, and uh, Mary, if, if you're getting emails like that, those, those are false, uh, I don't know if you can- uh... We're gonna read them, we're gonna read every email, yeah. Okay. The next comment is from Penny Alexa. 370 Spring Valley Lane. I am not in favor of having a group watch over the Milpitas Police Department. They do a great job and it would be a great insult to have someone questioning everything they do. Please vote no, thank you. Next is from Monique Jackson. Carmen Montano should resign. She thinks black people are hoodlums and criminals, probably thinks all lives matter too. She is unfit to serve office we have not forgotten how she did not bother to read Dominguez's memo on rent control and even fell asleep at meeting other week. And according to her math, two thirds is apparently 75% unfit. Okay. Uh, Pam, I believe you're on this call. If you could start reading comments that came in at 6.13 PM. Okay, we will do. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, from Yan Wang, 1039 Vida Larga Loop. My family and I strongly oppose the Police Oversight Committee and fully support Milpitas Police Department. I believe our officers do an excellent job. Yes, they sometimes make mistakes as in any large organization, but we are the, but we are the Milpitas Police Department not Minneapolis or San Jose. Historically, the majority of our police chiefs have been people of color since the inception of our department. Milpitas police use community policing. Thus, they are familiar with our neighborhoods. Our officers reach out to people, especially children in the neighborhoods, and our officers' rep reputation in the community is excellent. Please support Milpitas Police Department. Next is from Jackie Romero. Hello, Mayor Tran and City Council. We are requesting more information to be given to all city council members from city staff. We believe all five of you should be aware of the decisions being made during your time in office. Pam, this yes. one is for an item on consent calendar. Oh. Okay, so we'll skip that one. This will be heard later or we'll okay. let the mayor know. Okay, thanks for the heads yes, up. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, next is AJ Valdez. Hi, Mayor Tran, Vice Mayor Nunez, and Council Members Dominguez, Fan, and Montano. My name is AJ Valdez and I live in Milpitas. For the new fiscal year that starts July 1st, the Housing Department will get less than $10 million, while the police are getting over $38 million. The City Council approved an increase of $1.9 million for the Police Department, which is mostly going towards raises. That money should instead be used for housing, homeless services, recreational programs, or other human services. Next is from Yeda Duque. Hi, Mayor Tran, Vice Mayor Nunez, and Council Members Dominguez, Fan, and Montano. 
My name is Yeda. I live in Milpitas. I urge you to reduce the police budget and reinvest that money into building better response systems for nonviolent calls. For the new fiscal year that starts July 1st, the housing department will get less than 10 million, while the police are getting over 38 million. The city council approved an increase of 1.9 million for the police department for mostly going towards raises. That money could instead be used for housing, homeless services, recreational programs, or other human services. Why are the police personnel salaries going up nearly 7% during a recession? That 1,266,210 equals an average raise of 10,000 per employee. I'm going to stop right there because it's a minute already. I think we're doing three minutes. Um, oh, three minutes? Okay. Um, I, okay, hold on. In fiscal year 2021, patrol services will include two lieutenants, six sergeants, and 53 police officers. Since Milpitas is relatively safe and patrolling is precisely when racial profiling occurs, please reduce the amount of officers in the patrol unit. We should determine what number of officers are necessary for public safety and at what point there's an excessive number of people on one shift. According to the fiscal year proposed budget, three out of four Milpitas police officers are assigned to patrol. Patrol services are getting 21.5 million or 56% of the total police budget, which is 38,367,020. million of nearly 10% of the entire city budget. For reference, the housing department only gets 9.256 million or 4% of the city budget. Please take this into consideration. We need change. From Lisa Moreno. Good evening, Mayor Tran and City Council. We respectfully request consent items six and 12 to be pulled from the consent. This is a request on behalf of the Milpitas Parents Coalition. From Joseph Weinstein, 626 Hamilton Avenue, Milpitas. Mayor, City Council, City Staff. I shared the disgust of the actions of some police officers of the nation and support some of the proposed changes but changes should apply based on the performance of each city police department. Please stop for a moment to appreciate the Milpitas Police Department, their leadership, their officers, their staff. Their records stand for itself. The majority of Milpitas Police Chiefs have been people of color. For the past 20 years, the command staff has been dominated by people of color. Almost 20% of our officers are female. The two previous presidents of the Officers Association are gay. We hired the first ever Sikh officer in the United States. We changed post rules. We should be grateful. At the Black Lives Matter protest in Milpitas, the speakers from our community clearly showed their support for the conduct of our PD. Yet today, we are going to request, we are going to hear requests that our department needs more oversight that currently exists. On Saturday, the head of the local NAACP praised our PD, spoke highly of his relationship with our chief, and clearly had knowledge of the chief dismissing one of our officers. Our department communicates with anyone interested in their operations. They conduct ride-alongs, coffee with a cop, a citizen's academy. They have a strong social networking presence within the community. Our chief recently posted an open letter communicating his disgust over the death of George Floyd. We should be celebrating the conduct and reputation of our officers. They have earned it. We should not be saying, great job, but we need to keep a sharper eye on you just in case you do something wrong. That's not very motivating. Let's recognize the performance and dedication of the Milpitas PD in their support of our city. From Jackie Romero. I think she already had a comment, no? Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. From Han Wong. The Mokitas police is our friend. As a resident, we feel more safe with the police than the riots of the looters. Please don't discriminate the policemen in general. 
and we should pay respect to them instead of added control in how they do their work. Please say no to the steering committee and let the police do their job. Extra constraint just makes the police doing their jobs less efficient and more dangerous. Please don't get any pressure from the recent protest event. To our deputy city clerk, I just wanted to confirm that the Jackie Romero email is the same that um, our city clerk, Mary Lavelle, had seen, which is a consent item and not a new one. Let me let me go ahead and confirm that. Um, it's a request for removing another item from consent than was stated in the first public comment. Okay, if there's if there's a public forum comment, let's, we'll make sure that's heard uh, at this time. Do you want me to read this then? Uh, uh, yes, if it's the first public comment for the public forum. I know there's other emails from that resident uh, about other matters, but we'll go ahead and take the public forum comment. Okay, so this is from Jackie Romero. Uh, good evening, Mayor Tran and City Council. We respectfully request consent item number eight to be pulled slash removed from consent. This is a request on behalf of the Mopias Parents Coalition. We are also requesting action to be taken to create a community and city partnership task force to combat our growing unhoused community. There are several leaders from many Milpitas groups that would take part in this mission. We look forward to meeting with you in the near future. We are kindly requesting a meeting with city staff in the next 30 days to follow up this request. Thank you. From Tiffany Wong. Hi, Mayor Tran, Vice Mayor Nunez, and Council Members Dominguez, Fan, and Montano. My name is Tiffany Wong. I am appalled by the budget that was approved earlier this month, particularly the police budget, which will be getting over 38 million. We ask too much of the police. Please reduce their budget and reinvest that money into building better response systems to nonviolent calls. We should have mental health responders on call Un, unarmed city employees to resolve road hazards like broken taillights, social workers to house and connect the homeless to additional services and substance abuse professionals to intervene in drug use. The point is the police do too much and they are not necessarily the best people to respond to every situation they're assigned to. Rather than criminalizing social issues, let's put resources into solving them. There have also been people sharing their experiences of racial profiling in Milpitas online and at the recent marches. Since patrolling is precisely when profiling occurs, this is another reason why we should reduce the number of officers in the patrol unit. The patrol unit of the police is going to receive most of the police budget, 21.5 million for the next fiscal year. For reference, the housing department is not even getting 10 million. Furthermore, only a small percentage of crimes committed are violent. We should determine how many officers are necessary to respond to those violent crimes and at what point there's an excessive number of people on shift. Let's hire mental health experts and other professionals to address the other issues. Thank you for listening with an open mind. From Janet Chow, 284 Silver Lake Court. Hi, my name is Janet Chow, a Mopitas resident. Given the events that are happening in America, I'm taking this opportunity to learn and get engaged. I've emailed Richard Tran and the entire city council in the last week or so and haven't received any real response. I would like to understand when the 2020-2021 budget will be approved. And if it's not already approved, how can I provide my comments? If it's too late, then I still would like to learn about it for next year's budget. In addition, I saw the message from the chief of police on the eightcantwait.org campaign, but I would like to understand what conversations are happening regarding policing practices and policies and what the action plan is. Lastly, I emailed the planning department to understand the status of having Chick-fil-A Milpitas and haven't heard back either. The CEO is known to be controversial regarding LGBTQ and racial issues. I would like to understand the status of this project to see how I can voice my concerns. 
I hope that we can evaluate why our city is supporting this restaurant slash CEO who is against basic moral fundamentals and as an alternative, possibly push Milkitas to provide opportunity for black owned restaurants or black chefs to open shop here. I would appreciate it if the city council can share the status of these items. Thank you. From Ann L. Hamilton Avenue. Has the city and police department reviewed protocols for making arrests and reducing racial profiling? What improvements need to be made with regard to transitioning to a more anti-racist police department and community? Next is from Kyle Bacalos, 133 North Temple Drive, apartment 110. I'm going to share with you all a personal experience I've had here with the Mokitas Police Department. I want to strongly emphasize that even if you haven't experienced racial profiling, that does not mean it does not happen. The experience happened to my friend and I, we are both Filipinos by the way. At the time, we were actually only eighth graders that went to Rancho Middle School. On a summer day, my friend and I were walking to our friend's house, which was only three blocks away from my house. A cop car starts slowly creeping up behind us and we get nervous. We had done nothing wrong or even had anything illegal, but still our hearts were pounding like no tomorrow. He then stops us and exits the car, stating two suspicious young males into his radio. He then proceeds to ask all these questions. It seemed like he didn't believe some of our answers, even though they were true. Eventually, he asked for ID and got confused when he saw two middle school IDs from Rancho. He then tries to scan the IDs through his police scanner, which I'm sure came up with nothing, then returns our IDs. He then says, be careful, there's a lot of home invasions around here. So you thought these two young kids were gonna rob some homes, I thought in my head. For the longest time, I questioned everything about myself during the incident. I thought to myself, did I look suspicious? I mean, yeah, I had a flannel on, baggy pants, and I guess brown skin. I looked like a thug, right? Are those questions a 14-year-old have to ask for themselves? Though these experiences, this actually made me more insecure about how I look as an individual. Who are they to judge us based on color of our skin? Why should our black and brown children go through this? In conclusion, being president of the NAACP youth chapter, this is why we support community oversight. It's important for the community to keep cops accountable and to prevent situations like this that might happen. That's why I truly believe a better community site program is needed for situations like this. A program that can look at police files, react to complaints, et cetera, an oversight committee with power. I also support defunding the police and reallocating those funds to other programs such as social services and educational programs. Our police department receives 38 million and now 1.9 million is going to be accepted towards mostly raises amidst a recession and pandemic where many people got unemployed. This money should be going towards other programs that would help the community. Mary, I'm going to read the last three comments and then at 7.13, can you kindly pick up? Thank you. From, uh, Allison McDonald, let me see, let me check this one. Um, hold on, hold that up for me. We're not reading that one. Let me see. From uh, Vincent Academia, 1839 Dalton Drive. Hello, Mayor Tran, Vice Mayor Nunez, and Council Members Dominguez, Fan, and Montano. My name is Vincent Academia Jr., resident of Milpitas and member of the NAACP Youth Council. My comments is in regards to the number of police officers assigned to patrol and why it took three patrol cars to ask for my ID and what I was doing while waiting in my car to pick up my friend in 2018. The stated and city budget, 53 slash 71 officers are assigned to patrol a number that seems excessive when Milpitas is a relatively safe city. 
Patrolling is precisely when racial profiling occurs, therefore reducing the number of patrol officers would lead to less racial profiling. I believe it was racial profiling and excessive patrol officers that led to me being harassed by three officers in patrol cars. I was parked on Manfred waiting for my friend. When the first officer pulled up, I told my friend to stay inside in case it would prevent him from getting his green card. Without calling for backup, a couple more patrol cars pulled up. I did not know my rights, and they made me get out of the car, empty my pockets, search me, and told me to sit on the hood of the car while they threw everything around searching my vehicle. They found nothing and only succeeded in wasting my time because I never had anything illegal on me to begin with. Reduce the number of patrol officers and prevent future incidents like these from occurring. From Jamie Schlitzbaum, 1775 Millmont Drive. I emailed the city council members and the chief of police Armando Corpus last week concerning questions about our city and whether no knock warrants are legal. I was informed that although they are legal, they are not used. My issue with this is that not being used is a policy and not a law. I would like the city council to ban no knock warrants so that what occurred in Louisville does not happen here. I'm sure everyone is aware of what happened to Breonna Taylor in her own home while she was asleep. To prevent something like this from occurring in harming citizens or our officers, I would like the city council to ban no knock warrants in the city of Mokunas. Thank you. Mary, you there? Yes, I'll start reading now. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, the next comment is from Allison McDonald, but it's for an item on consent. So I'm going to move ahead. Uh, okay. The next comment is very lengthy and I'm going to time it starting now. This is from Leche Nguyen. Good afternoon, Mr. Steve McCarris. I am Leche Nguyen and I am a retired case manager of the city of Milpitas. I'd like to voice my opinion about our wonderful Milpitas Police Department. During my whole time working at the Barbara Lee Senior Center, all feedback I heard from our seniors pertaining to MPD were excellent and I'm so proud to reflect this in addition to my own experiences. From time to time while I was working, I made the request for MPD to perform the welfare check on my frail elderly clients and they were done with high efficiency. Our policemen and women are always happy to come give speeches for our seniors so they, they can be aware and prevent themselves from ID theft, stolen mail, how to watch out for scams, etc. Since 2008, my neighbor and I formed our neighborhood watch group and we obtained great assistance from MPD to organize our yearly national night out together. A few years ago, when I assisted the Sunny Hills apartment residents with their request to stay in their place, the MPD was so kind to offer us a big meeting room so that Sunny Hills tenants, a majority of whom were persons of color, could gather for a workshop presented by Fair Housing Laws Project representatives. The list of good deeds done by MPD could go on and on. However, to make it brief, I'd like to share from my own experience. More than 10 years ago, our family suffered a traumatic accident and it happened out of state. My husband and I had to leave home for a week to take care of it. The then Milpitas police chief was kind enough to send the patrolling officer to double check if our children were all right and if there was an adult to watch them at home. The police staff also contributed together and supported us with a check. This generous act was beyond their duties and our family is forever thankful for this kind heartedness from MPD. Since then, if there is a disaster occurs somewhere, we try to donate with the hope that we can extend the heartfelt deeds which our MPD has done for us and for many other citizens in the community. Please kindly share my email with the meeting when they raise any question about MPD. Thank you so much, Leche Nguyen and family. Next is from Ramon Vega of Milpitas. Good evening, Mayor Tran and City Council. When will the pool open for the Milpitas community? Thank you, Ramon Vega. Pause right there, uh, Mary, if I may. Let's 
Let's see if we can get an answer to that question uh, very quickly here. Um, but uh, I, I don't think we have any plans. Uh, maybe we could check in with, uh, I know it's kind of an um, instant uh, question, but uh, do we have any, um, what's the status of our pool and the county guidance? Mayor Tran, if Renee doesn't jump on and she can add to this, I'm happy to answer the legal question. Yeah, just, Chris, why don't you just take it? I know both of you have it, but you're here right now. Let's leave. So we, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. So we do have to follow the most uh, strictest order. And in this instance, the state is more strict than the county. Um, and their indication is that they're not allowing pools to open in phase two. Now there's future phases. And so we'll look at that. Um, but we are working on a document for city staff to share with the public uh, that will further explain these issues. Fantastic. Thank you for the update. Okay, we'll carry on, Mary, please. Okay. Your next comments I'm going to read you are from Chris Rios, 1775 Millmont Drive. I'm disappointed in the decisions of city council at a time when civil unrest is at its highest and people are demanding the reallocation of funds from police departments towards initiatives that benefit housing, education, and healthcare. This city council has failed to act appropriately. You should feel shame. How will this be looked at in six months, in six years? Residents are facing a crisis, and in the coming months, my friends may be homeless. I'm, I've am i struggled, and the grant of $5,000 from SVLC has saved my life and my family's life. Without that help, we would be homeless. Think about the many others that are in dire need of help. You're proposing decreasing the aid from $5,000 to $3,500 and imposing restrictions that make it near impossible for anyone to get the aid they rightfully deserve. Meanwhile, you're planning to increase the Milpitas police budget. Shame on you, shame on you and the optics this will have because clearly that's all you care about, the optics. Milpitas police does not need some $40 million in funding. What we need is equitable housing solutions. We need to cure homelessness in Milpitas. We need to invest in student education. We need to invest in healthcare for everyone. I'm beyond mad, disappointed, and disgusted by the morals of this council in choosing to take money away from homeless preventative measures and giving it to a growing police state. Your decisions this year will echo for decades to come. Mark those words. The next comment is regarding item 21, so I'm gonna move ahead. Thank you. Next comment is from Cassandra Vuong, 1711 Clear Lake Avenue, Milpitas. Hi, Mayor Tran, Vice Mayor Nunez, and Council Members Dominguez, Fan, and Montano. My name is Cassandra, and I live in Milpitas. In the wake of nationwide protests in response to the murder of George Floyd, I have felt compelled to address systemic police violence in this country, starting in my locality. I urge you to reduce the police budget, reduce the scope of police duties and reinvest that money into building better response systems for nonviolent calls. Studies show that more police do not make our communities safer. There is no stronger correlation between the number of cops and community safety. Police have time after time shown excessive use of power and force, especially on black, brown and indigenous people. The police should not be tasked with things they were never meant to do, such as be mental health counselors or deal with drug addiction. Instead of a police response, what if we had mental health responders trained in de-escalation on call at all times? Instead of a police response, what if we had specialized substance abuse professionals respond? Trying to solve everything through arrests and criminalization is only exacerbating social and racial inequality in our community. We need to redirect focus to solving the roots of these issues by reallocating police funding towards housing, homeless services, and other human services that directly improve our community. I ask that my taxpayer dollars go towards a new vision of a safe and healthy Milpitas for everyone. And that starts with defunding the police. Thank you for listening. Next is uh, name not provided. As there are predictions for a second wave of COVID-19, how is Milpitas going to minimize the risk? I see the mayor continually promoting outings. Some small businesses do not have the privilege to reopen until a couple months from today. All businesses except for grocery stores, hospitals, and gas stations should be open to minimize exposure. 
the National Guard was called to duty for the protests, but why weren't they called upon in early March to enforce curfews and patrolling to limit exposure? Next comment is from Allison McDonald, 672 Kevin Air Drive. While I am proud of the history and the demographics of our police force, however, I've been an advocate for the establishment of a police oversight committee for years, and I'm very happy to hear that this is being considered at this time. Oversight brings community experience to the table and can help to create a bridge. I hope that you will institute this in our community. Next is regarding item 20, so I'm not going to read that one. Next from a person who did not submit name or address, please elaborate on this current community oversight program. I have never heard of it. If it really is in place, then why doesn't the community know about or work together? Next from Charles Schletzbaum, 1775 Milmont. Please disregard the better Milpitas form letters who do not have the will to take it upon themselves to actually give their true opinion. Our police chief will not be please chief forever and the city council will not be the city council forever. It is very important that we put together an oversight committee that will be able to focus purely on police issues. Too many of our youth how had run-ins with the police, no matter what the good intentions were. While a police chief seems to be on the right track, we need to ensure that. Next from Thomas Johnson. I want to tell you that the Milpitas Fire Department is as first class as it gets and has the kind of people working for it that you should be proud of. They're great humans who work hard and care for the community. I support the MFD and everything about them. Thank you for hiring great people. Next from Irvish Meta with a PO box address in Milpitas. To Milpitas City Council member, please consider proposal for Milpitas parking permit program for commercial and residential program. Thanks, Irvish Meta. There's a subsequent comment from the same person, so I'm not gonna repeat another comment. Right. Next from Barbara Navarro, 915 North Hillview Drive, Milpitas. Mayor Chan, Vice Mayor Nunez and council members, I am proud to live in Milpitas. I believe our Milpitas Police Department, MPD, is an integrated and diverse department. Even though I do believe the MPD will need additional diversity and community training to assist them because tensions are high now and mistakes will be exposed if their response and actions are not viewed by the community as acceptable. More training on how to communicate with our diverse community can only assist our MPD. As a reminder, if and when folks start riding into Milpitas via the new BART station, it will bring people from other cities into our community and the perspective of these people will be different than those who live here. I respect our MPD and hope that our chief of police will prepare the staff and officers so that we all can continue to feel safe and that all community members will be treated properly when there is necessary contact. No decrease in officers is necessary in my opinion. I'm concerned about community MPD oversight and will follow this conversation closely so that I can be open to hear the concerns of others in our community. Thank you to MPD for all they do, Barbara Jo Navarro. Next from Lynn Spirit, Abel Street, Milpitas. I don't think we should wait for a tragedy to happen to put partnerships such as this into place. Being a person of color, I would hate to be that tragedy in order for change to be implemented. It's so unfortunate that so many people have had to lose their lives in order for change to start and policies even to be looked at across the US. And contrary to popular belief, not all of the victims were criminals, not all of them broke the law or even had a criminal history. One was a 12 year old child just playing at a park. 
I know many of you don't have that worry, so you probably won't understand my view, but that's always been a worry for me. I don't see any harm in this partnership, especially since these comments have nothing but positive things to say about our officers. That is not a bad or negative thing. Not sure why it's being looked at as such. The proposal isn't saying that the MPD is a horrible and the chief isn't doing his job well. If anything, it's giving the agency the opportunity to be transparent in their dealings with the community. The fact that there is so much diversity within the agency is a good thing, but it doesn't mean that there is no bias, no bigotry, and no corruption, because that comes in all shapes, sizes, and forms. If our agency truly is as good as it seems, the committee would never be utilized or have to intervene, right? I'm not sure of what the process would entail or how it would work, but I think at a time like this, the willingness to just be open would speak volumes of the chief as well as of the agency. Also, since the policies that are in place are working, an oversight committee wouldn't change that dynamic in any way, shape, or form. Just my thoughts. Have a blessed day, everyone. Okay, and Mayor, that's the last comment for public forum. There are a number of comments for other agenda items, including three for consent calendar matters. Thank you very much, Mary. And that's it for uh, public forum. That's all we're taking tonight. That's all we have. And that's the conclusion of the comments for public forum. I want to thank our uh, city clerk and deputy city clerk for um, really rising to the uh, changing uh, environment of our meetings and folks at home watching. When you send that, uh, when you click the send button on your email, uh, you, we, you know, it's important to understand that we have our city clerks who will be reading um, your email and the community's email. So um, let's, um, you know, be thankful. And if uh, maybe you send a public comment going forward, put a little thank you smiley face in there just to uh, let us know that we appreciate your support. Um, and. We'll continue to um, put our full effort into the transparency with uh, the community, as always. Fantastic. Moving on here to presentations. We have uh, three proclamations uh, this evening, and I will pull those up here on my iPad. Okay, first of the three, uh, it will be a proclamation for this month uh, here in June of 2020, and we're going to proclaim this month uh, as LGBTQ month. I do want to take a moment to uh, recognize uh, my colleagues, uh, Vice Mayor Nunez, for uh, really lifting the uh, recognition of our LGBT community. Uh, from our I think, pride day on the flag raising and just the flagpole itself, but that's a, even more of a, a really commitment to our community's diversity. So I, I do want to recognize uh, the vice mayor, Bob Nunez, for um, really, um, you know, setting down a, a foundation for this proclamation as we read it tonight. So I'll go ahead and read it. Now, this June marks the 50th anniversary of annual LGBTQ pride celebrations and events. And what an anniversary year. On June 15th, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of protecting LGBTQ people from workplace discrimination or firing, ensuring equal protection rights for people of all gender identities and sexual orientations in the workplace. That was some great news. Uh, very happy to see that decision, I'm sure, as with our community. So. At the same time, during this pandemic, when some LGBTQ individuals, especially young people, may find themselves sheltering in place with family members who may not be accepting, it's especially important that we, as a community, uh, say, hey, we see you, appreciate you, and accept you as the wonderful, unique individual you are. So we are allies who stand with you together in 2020 and beyond as we work to ensure your rights.
with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which really um, surrounds us in our daily lives. Milpitas and other cities around the world are unable to hold our traditional pride celebrations, parades, and events, which is why Milpitas is excited to participate in a virtual celebration of Global Pride 2020. Uh, that will take place on Saturday, June the 27th, with many other communities across the world. Milpitas is welcoming an open community. Uh, Milpitas is a welcoming and open community that recognizes the values uh, and values those who identify as a lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, uh, questioning queer, non-binary, and all other genders and sexualities. The city of Milpitas proclaims this month of June as LGBTQ Pride Month. The second proclamation we have this evening, folks, uh, is actually going to be a proclamation for July. However, um, as the city has operated uh, throughout its history, July is our recess, and there will be no public meetings um, as traditionally scheduled. And so we want to go ahead and recognize a very important uh, proclamation for July, and that's Parks and Recreation Month. Park and Recreation Month is a time to recognize the valuable contributions of the professionals that add so much to the quality of life in our communities. This year, the Milpitas Recreation staff made their usual extensive plans for special events and celebrations, in addition to, of course, all the many classes and activities for the spring, summer, uh, and beyond. All that planning was suddenly upended with the arrival of the pandemic and staff had to suddenly readjust. They quickly went into action and met the challenges. One, ensuring that our most vulnerable citizens, our seniors, were taken care of with meal and other essential programs. Thank you, Recreation Services. Two, creating a virtual community center with expanded online offerings and resources. Three, regularly communicating the latest updates on services and resources to our residents, such as the food giveaway on the first and third Saturday uh, of this month, I believe last month and uh, into early uh, August as scheduled for now. The city of Milpitas is fortunate to enjoy such a high level of service from our recreation professionals and proclaims the month of July as Park and Recreation Month. Okay. And the third proclamation um, is kind of a, um, a very um, emotional uh, part of the presentation tonight. And um, it has to do with racial racial justice and uh, the um, deeply saddening uh, murder of George Floyd um, and our society's response um, throughout our nation. Um, the city of Milpitas fully honors the rights of our residents to gather, uh, to speak out about what is important and to convey their feelings regarding needed change in our community and in our country. The recent protests around the country, including in Milpitas, are an effort to fight social injustice and ensure quality uh, for everyone. Uh, we must do better. I am uh, proud of the community in Milpitas that has stood up uh, to work for racial justice going back all the decades that we've uh, been a city. Uh, the city of Milpitas is one of the first integrated communities in America with a history of diversity and progressive, progressivism uh, and has been recognizing uh, a Juneteenth since 2017. 
With the upcoming Juneteenth Celebration Day, we must honor our African-American neighbors by acknowledging the pain of slavery and celebrating the end of that dark chapter in our nation's history. I think we're getting close. As we commit to working together to make our community and our country better. We celebrate strength, uh, resilience, and resolve of the African-American and Black community and call on Americans of all backgrounds to overcome injustice, appreciate what we have in common, and commit to building a brighter future. The city of MLP is hereby proclaimed the city's commitment to racial justice and proclaims uh, June 19th of this year as uh, Juneteenth, a celebration day. I remember that we had uh, our first Juneteenth celebration here in town and um unsurprisingly i want to you know uh recognize our vice mayor bob nunez for um his efforts with that we um won't be able to do it this year but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we're not doing all we can and uh, we'll be uh, celebrating next year uh june 19th okay uh and so i i, I do want to uh, continue here that wasn't uh, you know, I, I spoke on um, really the um, kind of the um, space and time we're in with uh, racial um, injustice uh, across our nation, uh, not specifically referring to Milpitas, but um, all our communities united as as communities that are um, committed to racial justice uh, in any way, shape, or form. And um, it's quite a time to, to be alive. Uh, I feel like we're going through a generational period of time. And I know here in America, uh, we uh, always come out of these um, kind of mm, pivotal years uh, or movements or eras uh, stronger and freer and more equal. So um, I have uh, another proclamation. Uh, I don't wanna say it's the best for last, but it is one that uh, means very much to our community, our families, uh, our neighborhoods and our nation. And our nation. So uh, this proclamation is a commitment to racial justice. The inexcusable killing of George Floyd on May the 25th, 2020, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, drew attention to racial inequities in America and sparked activism calling for accountability, justice, and change. The most basic form of injustice and inequity occurs when a group of people feel their safety is placed in jeopardy by the very people entrusted with ensuring their safety. The unrest regarding racial injustice, particularly towards the black community, has been building for decades. The people of the United States of America and in the city of Milpitas have affirmed that they will no longer tolerate the systemic pervasive racism that has been deeply rooted in our country. In particular, racism directed toward black Americans and Americans of African descent. The city of Milpitas recognizes the community desire for drastic societal change and stands with the black community, affirming that black lives matter. As, uh, whereas the city of Milpitas has a long history of racial activism, becoming one of the first racially integrated communities in the United States, the city of Milpitas is blessed to be a a uh, diverse multiracial community that believes in mutual understanding and respects, uh, uh, develops a healthier, uh, safer, and more caring community. Oppression and violence will not be tolerated in any place in Mil Milpitas period. With the city committed to upholding the safety, equal treatment, and rights of everyone, that includes you. In January of this year, the City Council reaffirmed its commitment to a diverse, supportive, equitable, and inclusive community. 
if we all dedicate ourselves to racial healing, empathy, inclusion, and transformation, we can bring about the necessary changes in thinking and behavior that will create a future where Black lives are equally valued and protected. Now, therefore, I, Rich Tran, the mayor of Milpitas, and on behalf of the Great City Council, do hereby proclaim the city of Milpitas is committed to racial justice, uh, proclaimed on the 16th a day of uh, June 2020. Um, I do want to take a moment uh, here before we move on in the agenda to um, just um, really um, support my colleagues um, on the council, uh, in the local and state and federal government, um, those that are Officials uh, are now being um, criticized and judged more than ever. And I just hope that our community, based on some of the public forum comments I heard, uh, I hope our community will really take a look at each of us as individuals and who we are and uh, who our what our families are comprised of and um, our values and our um, really background in public service. Um, you know, I think that's going to be key going forward uh, for racial justice. And I hope that our community and all communities will really um, not be quick to judge or believe in hearsay. Uh, and I, I know Councilmember Montano and, and her family, and she has persons in her family of African uh, descent, uh, Black. And so I just want to um, stand for racial justice. And I think that um, it's not, it's, it's a two way street sometimes. And I just want to really stand with Councilor Montana and, and, and really stand against any uh, false racial injustice claims. And, and so that, that's how I feel about the proclamation tonight. And um, let us go forward with um, kind of uh, wisdom. So thank you very much uh, for listening to the presentations tonight. I'm moving on here to announcements and future agenda items. Um, I do have an announcement. Um, but you know what? Let me check in with our city manager. Any uh, announcements from city staff? No, Mayor. There's no announcements from staff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Um, I do have an announcement. It's just um, um, I want um, my colleagues to know that, and I'm pulling up information on my phone here. It's kind of click on this. Um, I have, uh, in light of um, the great community concerns, I know I've received um, numerous emails regarding um, the uh, kind of events or the um, following the uh, murder of uh, George Floyd. I have, you know, as many of my colleagues and I'm sure the police department and the city manager, I'm sure everybody were receiving emails to really um, commit to action. And I know there's different police. I'm um, keeping under five minutes here, Chris. I see you. Um, uh, just some different uh, kind of desires in the community for things related to law enforcement and. <laughs> Um, I, I want to first thank um, our police chief, Armando Corpus, for his proactive um, and really phenomenal um, leadership. I, I, I am uh, really blown away, and I'm not even surprised, but I'm blown away by his leadership and him at the uh, peaceful protest, one of the greatest days in old Peter's history, um, and him going on stage and speaking to our community, along with our vice mayor, Bob Nunez, and council members uh, who were there. And so, um, and I know our, back to our chief, he's really being proactive with, I think he put out a memo stating that he, um, he really had everything concisely uh, written on the memo. And I look really look forward. He's really a step ahead always, and maybe two steps sometimes. And I, I'm really excited for our council to um, kind of um, 
perceive that uh, research review and everything uh, to bring back to us. I know there's the hashtags, eight can't wait. And what else is there? There's, uh, you know, all these really um, trending uh, ideas that uh, folks in communities all across our nation are putting forward. So I got tons of emails about that. I want to let folks know that, um, you know, our chief will be bringing that, that back to us. And so I'm excited for that. Uh, not much more I can say about that. I do see my colleagues with the virtual hand. We're going to get to you next. Um, but I did want to announce that um, what I did was um, I uh, received a call from Council Member Fan, and um, or it was a text message, one of the two. And he um, suggested um, that I s commit to the mayor's pledge by the Obama Foundation. And so with his kind of, mm, you know, encouragement, I think, I think he believes in that very much. I ended up um, thinking about it for several days, actually, because uh, it is a commitment that um, at least I as one person must follow through with to um, demonstrate a full commitment. So I signed the mayor's pledge for the Obama Foundation. I haven't really told many people. If you're on this call, uh, on this um, Zoom meeting across the city, where, wherever you're at, you're probably everybody heard it here first. I didn't, didn't even post it to my Facebook. So uh, I'll probably do that sometime soon. So I did sign the uh, Obama Foundation Mayor's Pledge and essentially, um, you know, the, the, it's uh, really advocated and pushed forward by my brother's Keeper Alliance. And it's calling on mayors to commit to uh, the following actions, review, engage, report, and reform. So I look forward to um, reaching out to our um, city manager and police chief to um, go through those steps. And it's not going to guarantee anything, uh, but um, I'm excited to uh, dive into more of um law enforcement policy to learn a lot more for myself and to um, see where we can make changes if there are. So I want to um, let everybody know that here in the announcements portion. And then uh, another thing I wanted to uh, really spend the announcement um, portion of our meeting for is to really talk about the protests. Um, we're getting a lot of calls from uh, folks in the community about uh, not everybody's for the protests. You know, I'll be, uh, I am for peaceful protests always especially for a good cause. But there are some in our community and frankly, uh, other communities around the nation that well, some people aren't into protests. And so that's fine. You know, that's just how the lay of the land is. But uh, people were concerned about the costs of um, our policing for public safety. It's really for public safety. I'll call it public safety. I know it's not a word, but it sounds good. Um, and you know, when a protest happens and it's such a deep, passionate cause, I think there's always going to be folks going to be out there marching. And so I, I want to really um, confirm and reaffirm my commitment to our city for doing the right thing, uh, for providing the public safety with our officers to ensure that everybody made it to the, you know, um, peaceful protest and made it back home. I think the most important thing for me over the last few weeks, a couple of weeks, is just seeing everybody make it back home um, safely, you know, and there was no reports or anything. Uh, and so uh, whether it was um, with policing or, pardon me, public safety, providing uh, public safety or um, just the basic needs for humans um, at the event, uh, you know, um, I'm thankful that our, our city made a decision for that. Um, and it's really a commitment by our city. Uh, folks are, you know, I'm getting calls. The residents are upset about the cost that it's involved, the fiscal impact. And um, I do want to say that I support uh, our, our city. And I stand by our city and um, I've always supported our city and our approach. Uh, and, but there are residents that they, they do want some transparency and they're kind of holding me to it. A lot of times I get held to a lot of things. And um, if our city manager can put out a, um, statement uh, for our community just showing that um, you know this the, what the kind of steps we've taken to ensure the public safety during the two pro the two protests um, and, and have that for our community because um, 
you know, residents do want to know. And you could put me on there as a supporter of how we did things a hundred percent. Um, yeah, this is not a, um, anything else, but for residents to understand what we did, um, as a city government to ensure our people, our human beings are, um, safe and alive and well. So, um, that's my request. Uh, if there's any objections, uh, now's the time. I don't think there are, I think it was really blessed to see everybody out there participating safely. And if we put a memo out pretty much saying the fiscal impact of, of what it was and kind of the basic, basic, basic humane steps we took, um, a statement out to our residents, because I think that's important too, for transparency and you can put my name on there if you want, or anybody's name or nobody's name. It's not really about that, but I just, I just want to make sure it's a cool statement for everybody. So um, I appreciate your time uh, for listening. Uh, those two things. So next up here with the virtual raise hand, we have council member Dominguez. Mayor, before we go to the next oh, member, okay. I just wanted to give the council a gentle reminder. So for announcements under the open government ordinance, you as council members get the same time as the public under public form. So that would be three minutes. And then for future agenda items, you'd want to complete the request and then obviously a vote within a six minute time increment. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor, for the time. And thank you so much, Chris, for that directive. At this time, I would like to kindly ask the council for your support um, as we have just made a commitment to racial justice. I do believe that it's really important that it starts with us. And so I am making the recommendation to please ask for your support in bring me, bringing back, um, making implicit bias training, uh, the two hour duration, just as we have sexual harassment training for elected officials in, in our city, the city of Milpitas. I would also like to see implicit bias training of the two hour donation for all elected officials um, in the city of Milpitas in order to ensure a non-judgment lens um, is applied when we are making decisions and allocating funding to our city programs. I do believe that this will be the first um, of many um, things that we will do, but I do believe that Mopitas could take the charge. And I have heard all of you say that it begins with us. And so I think it would be great if we, um, as a collective body, uh, made ourselves aware of our own biases um, and made this training mandatory for ourselves just as sexual harassment is. And so I would kindly ask for your support in bringing back this item for a full council vote um, in the next council meeting, because it's our last one. Um, I thank you again for your time and consideration. I, um, can we get a, a, a memo or something about that first? I, I, I don't wanna have the discussion because that's not what this is for, but I do need more information. Can we just get a memo sent out to everybody so that I can review it? I, I know we're voting on things on the spot, but I need more information. Um, I would gladly, but my concern is that we're gonna run out of time. So how many council meetings do we have left? Mayor, would you like me to address, answer that question? Yes, please. Yes, we, we have a meeting um, next Tuesday and the following Tuesday. Oh, okay, perfect. I, um, I would, Chris, we don't need memos during this time. So I would kindly ask for a line vote um, if possible, Mayor. Thank you. And Mayor, at this point, I'd, I'd recommend if you guys just wanna vote to decide if you have this on the next agenda so you guys can talk about it and potentially get more information. Mm -hmm. And then I could bring a memo definitely once it comes back, I'll make sure that I do a full research and analysis and bring a memo before you. Uh, is, is this a training from the state of California or is it a private institution? I could definitely include that in the memo. Uh, the trainings are different formats. So uh, one way um, that other cities have done it are just like we get our sexual harassment training. And I know that Chris could help us with that. Go well. to our city attorney. If it's a state of California government type of um, mm -hmm. uh, training, then I'm, I'm going to be for it. But if it's a private type of uh, institutional Training, I, I can't, I'm not sure. I, I don't know what that's about. That's, I want to be clear with my taxpayer money. Yeah, no, thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't want you guys to get into a discussion about it, this topic tonight, but I think if you do want to talk about it at your next council meeting and learn more, then let's go down the line and see who's supportive of a yes vote to have it come back for discussion or no vote to not have it discussed. 
I heard the vice mayor. I think I heard the vice mayor request the uh, comment. Okay. Yeah. So um, could I hear what what we're being asked to vote on again? Because I'm I just wanted to make sure what it is the vote is for. Uh, the vote would be if you are interested in hearing an item where it would make implicit bias training. This is the same training that our police officers, very similar to the police officers training. I believe that we must be um, leaders if we're making our staff do it. I think it should, we should do it. But I also think that it would help us bring a lens of equity to our budget items and to the policies that we're passing. So, so and I could bring more information in the memo just because I can't discuss it right now. Yeah. But um, I believe it's just if you are interested in um, having implicit bias training mandatory for elected officials. Um, again, it's just like sexual harassment, yeah. uh, but it's all about implicit bias. So, um, so Chris, I've seen those on your website. So, so I, I, as long as that's where the period is, I'm fine bringing that back for discussion. That last part, there's a lot more to that. So as long as that's that first part, I'm fine with that. Why don't we go down the line since we have council uh, chiming in at this point. So let's start with council member Fan. A yes vote would be mean it would be on a future agenda for discussion and potential consideration. Um, can we not limit um, it to uh, just um, uh, council uh, for the training though? I think uh, mm. maybe uh, including um, commissioners and staff. Uh, staff. staff, I think staff would be, it, be really Good important point. for the rest of staff to have that too. So if we if, if we can make that adjustment, I'm I'm fine. I'm open to having that conversation. I don't I don't want to go into the weeds because I don't want to get in trouble. So sure, but yeah. definitely I hear you. <laughs> I hear your council member fan. I, I hear sure you. Make sure the agenda is broad enough that you guys can yeah. have a discussion about. Yeah. It. Okay. Yeah. I'm uh, like looking at Chris. I don't, I don't want to get in I don't want to get any of us in trouble. But yes, I hear you. I, I hear you, Anthony, on that one. Yeah. I just I just want to have the leeway um you know uh, with how it's agendized so, uh it, in that case um it, it's a yes for me councilmember montana uh yes to bring it back to for discussion yes um and uh councilmember dominguez yes uh vice mayor nunez he said yes and mayor tran yes perfect thank you thank you So I, uh, Mayor Tran, I don't have, yes. I can't see my little hand to raise my hand, but I had an announcement as well. Okay, um, I, I do see Vice Mayor Nunez's hand. Okay. So I'm gonna go to you after him, is that okay? Oh, sure. Because he made the, he clicked on it, so I gotta recognize that, so. Uh, Vice Mayor Nunez, your microphone is uh, muted, yes. Okay, thank you. I want to lower my hand now quickly. Um, so um, I do want to say that I, I attended, I think, three of the marches. And um, I, I do want to go back to, uh, I was at, um, at the BART opening. Uh, though I did not see uh, Council Member Montano fall, I was there while uh, we were trying to make sure that we wrapped her leg and her wrist and uh, um, so I just uh, hoping you're feeling better, um, uh, council member, because um, you truly did take quite a spill there. Um, and so I, I do want to be able to say that you're always going to have persons that are going to see things in different ways. And um, I think it's important that as a community, we do, um, as long as we're talking, that's the important part, uh, I think, for us. Um, I stand 100% behind the Milpitas Police Department, uh, the officers and the chief. And I think persons have to realize we have a system in place and that is the um, uh, Public Safety Commission. Um, and uh, Council Member uh, Dominguez uh, is our liaison there. And that's been in existence for 18 months. And before that, there was another commission so I'm not quite sure where persons thought we were gonna do something else because I don't see it on this agenda and I don't know that anybody's asked to have it on an agenda from the council. So I think I go back to some of the words you use, Mayor. And first, I wanna congratulate you on, on signing the Mayor's Pledge. I did not know that till you stated it. 
uh, tonight. Um, and I think that's big. I think that's large because it's a personal commitment. Um, I think that we're all doing things um, in, in a way that is personal to us. Um, I don't have the social media presence that everybody else on this commission has. Uh, what I have is I show up. Um, um, and uh, the mere fact that all of you showed up, I have to tell you, uh, made me proud to be part of this commission. Um, they can, persons can say how great we are or point fingers and say, well, you could have done more. The mere fact that we showed up um, uh, and we lended our voices to this community, I think is important. So uh, I am proud to stand by each and every one of you and uh, council member uh, Montano, I know that once you get to be able to stand up again, uh, you will be there right there with us. So I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the rest of this meeting tonight. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor, appreciate you. And we'll move, carry it to the council member Montano here. Uh, thank you, Mayor Tran. Uh, so for the announcements, I know we, it's either a yay or nay <clears throat> and uh, one of the one of the uh, ideas that I wanted to bring to the council uh, for discussion is to form a, um, a a day worker program. What I see are very uh, a lot of um, especially in these days when people are hurting uh, financially. Uh, I see a lot of people looking for work out in the street, um, and I think a day worker program. Is, is essential in our city. Um, the city of San Jose has one with Conexion. We can, we can look to them for uh, expertise. The city of Mountain View has one as well. Uh, I think that would be a good way to help uh, people that need our help. So, um, so I'm proposing for a day worker program in our city. So that way we can uh, help those that are in need. And then the second item is, um, this one is a little bit controversial. Maybe you might want it, but I'm gonna put it out there anyways. Uh, I know the city council terms are 12 years. I would like to propose it to be eight years. So that way it opens it up for other people, uh, you know, to have a chance to run for city council. Um, so I'd like to put, that's my second one that I would and we can go. We can go down the line and say yay or nay, and then we and then we'll end it at that. And then, um, and then I want to say something about uh, about my life here in Milpitas that I've been here, and, and I'm really I was really appalled to hear people accusing me of being a racist. Uh, my my grandkids are half black and half Latino, so for me to for someone to call me a racist, that's ridiculous. And then my history here in Milpitas being the founder of the Sunny Hills Improvement Association because um, it was a neglected neighborhood. And, and the fact that this, I support our Milpitas police wholeheartedly because they were members of the chiefs, the first chief that we had, uh, Chief Murray, he was a member of the Black Caucus and he, he embraced diversity. He was the first to hire a woman of women officers. He was the first to, uh, eliminate the height requirements for police. Milpitas is very unique. It's not like your other cities. We have a, a very strong foundation. And now we, we had, uh, we had uh, Chief Acosta, who was a Mexican American. We had uh, a female chief of police, uh, Lucy Carlton. We had a chief uh, Lawson, who was uh, African American. And we had uh, Chief Angelini, who was Filipino American. Then, and then now we have, um, Armando uh, Corpus. So we have a, a history of supporting, of, of having diversity, even when we were the first planned integrated neighborhood in the country. So we have deep roots here. I mean, I've been here in Milpitas for a very, I went to schools here. African American community embraced me and I was a member of the Black Caucus in Milpitas. I've been here for a very long time and, and it's really sad. I'm really hurt actually for someone to call me a racist. It, it, it really is emotional. Um, <clears throat> but uh, with that, I wanna make sure that uh, we, we support our Milpitas police and, and, we, and of course our police have, they don't have 
all those things that uh, that some of the um, that they're that they're asking for reform because it started with Chief Murray way back. I mean, he even he even told his officers he could, that his officers would would uh, were not allowed to get free coffee from the businesses. I mean, that's how much integrity uh, this 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 man had and. And he set the foundation for our Mopitas Police Force. That's why I'm so proud to live in Mopitas. And, uh, and I know that's why Mopitas uh, Police, they, they really support our community and our, and our community support them. Um, but yes, you're right. Uh, we, I, my prayers go out to the family for George Floyd because that was, that was so unnecessary. It was so horrible. And, um, and my heart is broken for, for that family and, and for, and for uh, George Floyd. And I know that we can always improve just like the memo that the chief put out, you know, we're not, they're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Only Jesus Christ is perfect. And, you know, I, I, I hope that we can move forward and, and, uh, and do what's, what's right in our community. So with that, thank you very much. And um, if you can vote on those two items that I put forward, yay or nay, that's on for future discussion. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you very much, Councilor Montano. Can't thank you enough. Okay, so let's get to it. The, the first one, the day worker program. If uh, and so we'll go down the line to Chris. Your Mayor, um, Council Member Fan. Yay. Council Member Montano. Yes. Council Member Dominguez. Yes. Vice Mayor Nunez. Yes. And Mayor Tran. Yes. And the next item is the council term limits, which would be eight years versus the current, I believe, 12. Um, and this would just be for a discussion. So you're not acting on it tonight. Uh, council member Fan? Hey. Okay. Council member Montano? Yes. Council member Dominguez? So since something was added onto mine, could I add the mayor's term as well? Term limits on the mayor and how that could we add that into your discussion, Councilmember Montano? No, I want to just focus on the city council and then maybe somebody can bring that up in the future. Okay, then no. Well, Chris, why don't we just have an item for just a open discussion? It doesn't have to be specific tonight. How's that, Chris? Uh, you mean in terms of uh, the next agenda? The next yeah, because obviously we're not talking about it tonight. So just yeah. how about this? Just make it a, make it a, uh, a motion for just an open discussion for term limits in general. How's that sound? We can agendize it as broadly as- uh, Councilor Montana, is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah that, that would uh, fit uh, Councilor yeah. Dominguez's uh, concern as well. Let's start over uh, then, well, so let's start my over. Question, I have another question. Would that be for the next to the last meeting or is this one that would go on your list, Mayor, for uh, and continue in August? I think uh, we're gonna hear everything uh, in August, I really. August is really a great time to hear things beginning the fiscal year. So yeah, let's do August for this. Yeah. I mean, it's on the agenda. It'll be on the agenda. We'll, if we get to it or not, that'd be another question, but have a, yeah, for the next meeting. So we'll just keep putting it on the agenda. That's fine. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Fine. Okay, great. Let's start the vote over if we may. So the question on the table is to have a discussion in August about term limits generally for everyone who has a council seat. Um, we'll start at the end. Councilmember Fan? Nay. Councilmember Montano? Yes. Councilmember Dominguez? No. Vice Mayor Nunez? That's, that's a confusing vote. Aye. <laughs> no, Mayor Tran? Yes. So that's three uh, in the affirmative, so that will be on in August. I was caught by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> All we're doing is having a discussion, right? So, just to clarify for our uh, our city manager, do you need direction on? I think the item we did add implicit bias that's coming back at the next meeting. Is well, th yeah, thank you for get, getting us that direction because I heard for discussion and I heard the term future agendas mentioned <laughs> on the previous item, so it hasn't been clear as to the next meeting, the following meeting, August future agenda. Well, I think um, <laughs> they're all going to go on the list, there. so they will all be listed as your other items, and we'll I just think lay them there. A, and then the next yeah. regular scheduled meeting, a regular city council meeting, that would be August, as far as a regular scheduled meeting. I think I think that's okay. Um, you know, any type of change wouldn't happen soon, anyways, because this would have to go to the voters of Milpitas. So, 
Okay. I see a virtual raise hand. Council member Dominguez. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, one item that I do feel um, needs our leadership and I would like to bring to the body is um, there is the the ban of evictions that Santa Clara County has placed is, is set to expire on July 28th. We're all gonna be on recess. And so what I would hate to see is an exodus of tenants being losing, being displaced and losing their homes. So what I would like to have is an emergency discussion to go on the next council meeting before we leave on recess to come back with a solution to ensure that our tenants will not be evicted while we are on recess and we would not be able to do any policy changes. My hope is that Santa Clara County extends this, but because we have one more council meeting left, um, I would not be able to sleep tonight in good conscience knowing that we did not bring something forward and we weren't being proactive to save the homes, um, the roofs over people's head while we are in recess. And so I would like uh, your support in bringing back this item for discussion at the next and last council meeting to ensure that there is currently protections for tenants while we are on break. Um, I would kindly ask for your yes vote. Thank you. I'm going to see attorney here. Uh, this, this is a legal matter. Um, does our city, um, what kind of impact does our city have if we were to uh, kind of go more progressive on this policy? So the cities can adopt their own eviction moratorium, but the county has taken the lead in this instance. Um, and so I think we're all watching the county to see what they decide to do next. Um, and I ask our city manager, do we have two additional meetings coming up before the end of the month? So we have the 23rd and the 30th. So this could go on either, either meeting. But yeah, I think the 30th would be good just so we can uh, see what develops with the county. I'd, have, I'd hate to um, duplicate uh, policy making here in the local level. So we'll go to Chris for the vote. Uh, Council Member Fan. Hi. Council Member Montana. We'll come back to her. Um, Council Member Dominguez. Yes. Uh, Vice Mayor Nunez. No. And Mayor Tran. I'll abstain. So right now, I think you have two affirmative, one no, one abstention, and Councilman Montano just wanted to see if you wanted to vote on this one. So technically with two in the affirmative, one no, one abstention, that does pass. Can you explain that to me? I'm not sure. Abstentions don't count as a no vote. Um, and so the, you only count who's actually voting and you have two yes votes and one no vote in this instance. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further announcements? Uh, one more. Sorry, may I, Mayor? Oh yes, please, please. Thank you. Um, another one that I do believe, and I thank you all for your patience. These are just comments that have been brought to us by Mopetians. And so I wanna make sure that I share them with you. Um, I would like to ask staff if you could please bring back a list of charges that the city could provide subsidy to our small business community. Um, we all have seen how unfortunately they have been impacted. Um, I know that this was something that was talked about in our subcommittee, but unfortunately did not get enough votes to move forward um, as part of the recommendations that you guys have seen. Um, and therefore I am asking um, the entire body to please support our small businesses um, with some sort of subsidy. And I'm not too sure what those fees would be, but again, that's why I'm asking for you to bring back this conversation, um, hopefully before we leave on recess to help our small business community who's holding on to a thread for survival. Currently, we already have 30% of our small businesses that have gone under. We predict that another 30% will um, before the end of July. And so they desperately need our help. I, ask you to please consider my request and ask you for your I vote. Thank you. Are you talking about the small business grant program? No, what I would like to see is a list of city charges 
that we would be able to subsidize for our small business community. And again, that conversation could take place um, when we bring this back. Uh, but I do know that our chamber has requested that as well with over 110 small businesses. At this point, they're asking for any kind of support that the city could subsidize um, those fees um, and again, I don't know what they are, but it would be something that I would ask the staff to bring back and for the council to have a full discussion on. Steve, uh, our city manager, are, I mean, uh, what what does this entail? I'm, I'm, I'm quite concerned about um, what the impact of this could be. I'm not sure, you know, the Basically. proposer is not even informed of what these fees are so can you bring some light to this there is a business license fee it actually might be a tax maybe walter could help me with that if that's something that can be subsidized typically when i think of fees and i hear fees subsidized that means the city would have the general fund pay those fees for the purpose of whatever purpose those fees were put in place uh, but in a business license i'm not sure if that holds true that's the only fee that comes in, it's an annual fee of a business, whether it's a small business or a large business. There may be other fees when they're coming in and doing work with their properties or their businesses or tenant improvements. I'm not sure if that is also something that the council would want to be reviewing. Existing businesses doing business though would just be paying that license fee. I don't believe there's any other fee to the city. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll go to Chris uh, for the vote. Well, be before we go oh. to the vote, here, if I could, just real quick. Yes, Vice Mayor, yes. Um, just a point of order, Chris. Um, since we have on the agenda, don't we have the something with Alex and the plan? There's a small business um, item, which is item number 20. Yeah. Um, because this, this is to put it on for consideration some other time. Or is this the time we get to actually ask staff to do work? I didn't think of this as the time to ask staff to do work. This is to put it on the agenda to ask staff to do work. I mean, if, if this is something we need to act on, because this isn't going to come back to us till August, right? Couldn't we, if we're going to discuss this, couldn't, you, couldn't we do that under number 20? I think under number 20, you guys could have a light discussion about this and okay. provide direction to staff. So, so I'm just thinking if you're going to do anything with it, uh, council mm -hmm. member, um, we're not going to get to it till August th th in this process. I'm okay with talking about it. If I can talk about it in the item I, yeah, I, that's, I for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to make sure that you don't get frustrated <laughs> further down the line here. Um, um, and uh, so city manager, I'm, I'm not trying to do anything other than no, Thank Make sure you. we talk about it at the right time. So, um, so Chris, I'm you okay tell me. With, I, I'm okay. I'm okay with doing that if that's something that we could do. I just didn't see it agendized, yeah. so I wasn't sure. But yeah. it sounds like we can. So I'm totally okay with having that discussion. Then, thank you so much, yeah. Vice Mayor, for that yeah. direction. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, Councilmember Fan. Did you have your virtual raised hand or? Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll go to Chris here uh, for the vote. Oh, I think uh, I think what yeah, was we're just... is that we'll talk about it in number twenty. Light oh, okay. Light light. Staff, we could take that. Okay, awesome. great. Announcements continue if uh, anybody would like to. Oh. <laughs> okay, great. Moving on here to announcement of conflict of interest and campaign contributions, Chris. Thank you, Mayor. I'd ask the Mayor and each Council member whether he or she has any financial or personal conflict of interest related to any of the items on tonight's agenda. And we'll start at the end. Council Member Fan? None. Council Member Montano? We'll come back. Council Member Dominguez? None. Vice Mayor Nunez? Um, none except for I have a question of you, Chris. Uh, sure. C13, since I'm on the VTA board and this one is about buying property from VTA, can I vote on that one? Have you discussed it on your end at BTA? Yes. And you can, you don't get any, to tell me you do get 
government salary or a stipend for sitting on the PTA board? Yes. Government salary is exempt. I, I get a stipend. It's exempt from the okay. uh, political reform act. But if you feel as if your loyalties are divided based on where how you voted at PTA. Not at all. I okay. know where my loyalties are. <laughs> You're fine to vote now. We'll just note it for the record. Okay. And then uh, Mayor Tran. No. And Councilmember Montano, did you? I saw uh, your. Did you? Did, am I? Am I? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. No. Thank you. And I'd also ask Mayor and Milpitas Council to please disclose any campaign contributions of 100 or more received within the last 12 months from any party entering into contracts with the city on tonight's agenda or any development project applicants on tonight's agenda. Uh, Councilmember Fan. None. Councilmember Montano. None. Councilmember Dominguez. None. Vice Mayor Nunez. I see him saying no. And Mayor Tran. None. Let the record reflect none to both questions, with the exception that uh, Vice Mayor Nunez has noticed he noted he sits on the VTA board in relation to item C13. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Textbook as always. Moving on approval agenda. Looking for a motion to approve the agenda, hopefully without any changes. So moved. So moved. Second. We got a motion by Councilmember Montana, a second by Vice Mayor Nunez. All in favor of virtual roll call, Councilmember Fan. Aye. Aye. Councilmember Fan. Councilmember Montano. Aye. Councilmember Dominguez. Aye. Vice Mayor Nunez. Aye. Myself is denied. The agenda is approved. Moving on to consent calendar. For consent calendar, I'd like to add to the consent calendar. I would like to add item number 22 and 23. And twenty-four. <sighs> if there's any objections, please make it known at this time. I would like to discuss it. So I number twenty-three, I would like to go through the presentation and discuss it if that's okay. Okay, great. I just wanna make sure we might go late this evening. Due to the- uh, Okay, the Mayor. Okay, you pulled my arm. That's fine. You can put on consent. Uh, but with consent, uh, but one thing, can we do a press release on it? That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Awesome. We're good. Uh, press release on any item that's approved. Mary, I think I see Mary. I'd just like to check with our city attorney if the first reading of an ordinance is acceptable oh. to be on consent. I thought that had to be read out. It can be on consent, but I, I will need to read that. the title of the ordinance uh, as you guys vote. So. Uh, you could do it one of two ways. I think have it on consent with me reading the title of the ordinance and taking an official vote um, outside of the consent calendar or just leaving it off for full discussion. Let's let's do the, the, the first there. Okay, yeah. so when we get to yeah. consent, we'll have a vote on consent and I will read the title of the ordinance um, and you guys could vote as a whole. Uh, one more thing, Mayor, because um, council member Fan was a co on that. Is that okay if we ask him if he's okay with that? With With the what? Are you okay with this item moving into consent and just putting a press release on it? Oh, I'm fine. As, as long as, okay. uh, you know, the press release covers everything. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So could, um, yes, Vice Mayor. Could you just read them the ones that you're putting on consent again one more time? Yes, I'll, uh, absolutely. So let me scroll down here. Item number 22, 23, okay. and 24. Okay. So I'll move the consent calendar with and adding 22, 23, and 24. Second. We got a motion by Vice Mayor Nunez, you have a second by Council Member Montano. And then when the vote's concluded, we'll go to our city attorney. Yes. Uh, and so we will go for the vote. Council Member Fan for the consent calendar. I think I saw he, he said I. I think he said yes. I think, you know. He did. He did. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Councilmember Montano. I sorry. <laughs> okay, I heard Councilmember Montano and then Councilmember Dominguez. Aye. Vice Mayor Nunez. Aye. Myself is denied. The consent calendar is approved. Let's go to Chris. Okay, so for the vote on item 23, which is not going to be discussed, um, what you have before you is ordinance number 306, an uncodified ordinance of the city council of the city of Milpitas for the local implementation of the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, otherwise known as CEDAW. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chris. 
Just and to clarify that, Mayor, sorry, the, the motion will be to introduce this ordinance and waive okay. beyond the title. That's right. That's right. So I'm looking for a motion. So move. So move. Oh, we got I'll, a motion second by, I'll second it. We got a motion by Council Member Dominguez. We have a second by Vice Mayor Nunez. All in favor, virtual roll call. Council Member Pham. Aye. Council Member Montana. Aye. Council Member Dominguez. Aye. Vice Mayor Nunez. Aye. Myself is denied. The motion is carried. The item is approved. And we will go straight to community development. Uh, number 20, approve the Milpitas Small Business Grant Program utilizing community development block grant. CDBG funds for micro enterprise businesses and small businesses. And uh, as the agenda states, we're going to our director of economic development, Alex Andrade. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council, City Executives. It's my pleasure to be here in front of you to discuss the Small Business Grant Program. For the record, my name is Alex Andrade. And um, I'll start by indicating that our small business community is certainly um, feeling um, the difficulty of trying to stay alive during these tough times. And so um, I've been receiving both emails and messages about this program for our business community. So I'm excited to have this conversation. So just to remind you where we were a couple of weeks ago on June 2nd at the city council meeting, the council did acknowledge that the current shelter in place order has really been difficult for our local business community and our workforce. I have mentioned that our most recent numbers in unemployment is 12.7% and that's well beyond the numbers that we had during the Great Recession. You also approved establishing a $200,000 small business loan program in partnership with the fiscal agent uh, team of Enterprise Foundation and Kiva. Although it wasn't determined, the council was generally interested in utilizing CDBG funding, that's community development block grant funding, rather than using the city's general fund. You did provide direction to staff to return with more specific information on utilizing CDBG funding, uh, in particular pre-funding uh, dollars uh, to provide the most expedient and effective way to disperse CDBG dollars to qualifying small local businesses. And you also recommended or directed rather to reach out to various cities and learn about best practices. Next slide, please. So during that time, and even actually prior to that, um, well, can you go back one more, please, Mike? Here we go, yes. So what staff has learned in the last couple of weeks, and even before that, is that per HUD, the city may pre-fund dollars to itself, uh, totaling 25% of the current year allocation prior to entering a service contract with our fiscal agent. And when you take the dollars of the COVID uh, CV dollars, which, is, which are the supplemental um, CDBG dollars with the standard dollars, it, it equals a little more than a million dollars. So that means that the city can pre-fund itself at about a sum of $268,000. We've been in conversations with the cities of Fremont, South San Francisco, Cupertino, Gilroy, and we recognize that they are at some point uh, discussing CDBG funds for either a loan program or a grant program. We also were directed to reach out to our counterparts with the cities of Riverside and Costa Mesa. I have not heard back from folks in Riverside. Um, uh, Mr. Linares of Costa Mesa and I have been trading voice messages, but as of today, we have not actually made contact. The one important thing that we've learned is that many Bay Area cities are opting to proceed with grant programs as opposed to loan programs. And what we've learned is that because it requires minimal reporting, minimal, minimal tracking, resulting in much faster dispersion of funds, which is really one of the key priorities for the council. And so also, and we know this in talking to various uh, fiscal agents, Opportunity Fund, um, Main Street Launch, and of course now uh, Dennis King, the Executive Director of Enterprise Foundation. Cities that are producing or, or proceeding with loan programs, of course, have to contend with 
burdensome underwriting requirements. Uh, there's quite a bit of labor that goes into the administration of loans, in particular, if they are revolving loans. And then recipients are required to pay interest rates in some instances. Our council, you have um, indicated that you would like the interest rate to be zero. But um, by taking a loan, the, we're, these businesses would be taking on more debt. So uh, staff believes and recommends that the grant option better meets your overall objectives of streamlining, uh, expediting, and protecting the general fund. We also have learned through our, our HUD representative that the CDBG funds would be available in early July. Um, we'll get into this in just a little bit, but that is based on action that you will consider and possibly take at the June 23rd meeting. Next slide, please. So this is a slide related to micro enterprises and small businesses. Again, back on June 2nd, you approved the sum of $200,000 for a small business loan program. We are talking to you today about a small business grant program. Mm -hmm. Enterprise Foundation uh, has indicated that they are certainly excited to be partnering with the city. There is an administration fee of 5%, that equals $10,000. That means that of the $200,000, there would be $190,000 available. If we were to proceed with $5,000 grants, that means we would be able to assist 38 businesses. HUD defines micro businesses as those that employ five or fewer businesses, including the business owner. And small businesses are defined as those that have six people or employees uh, or more. We decided to do a little bit of research through our business license list just to figure out how many micro enterprise businesses and small businesses do we have. The result was that 77% of our overall businesses are micro enterprise businesses. Again, five, is five employees or fewer with 23% being inclusive of small businesses or large businesses. So, what we uh, propose is that CDBG grant dollars benefit 75% uh, uh, totaling $145,000 to micro enterprises and the remaining 25% totaling $45,000 be uh, granted to small businesses. And then again, there's the $10,000 administration fee. Next slide, please. So in terms of next steps, if uh, you as a council body would like to proceed, uh, we are already having discussions with Enterprise Foundation on a term sheet. That term sheet has various provisions and stipulations as to how we're going to move forward. Of course, we have to execute a contract with Enterprise Foundation as our fiscal agent. And there are various bodies of work that must be um, achieved, the application, we of course would have to do very comprehensive business outreach, the administration of the program and the determining roles both internally within uh, the city and of course the roles between the city and Enterprise Foundation. The next three bullets have to do with uh, action. Just yesterday, the CDBG subcommittee met and while I wasn't able to make it, I do believe that the $200,000 CDBG funds for this program was discussed. It is expected that on June 23rd, the city council will consider and perhaps um, make a determination or, or proceed with an annual action plan allocation. And then uh, sub subsequently on the following Tuesday, June 30th, the city council would consider substantial amendments to the consolidated plan the June 23rd date is important because that's when the two week time frame would begin. And that's what the HUD representative indicated when the CDBG dollars would be available. So that takes me to staff recommendation. Number one, approve the small business, the Milpita small business grant program. Number two, direct staff to include $200,000 in community development block grant funds for the Milpita small business grant program as part of the approval of the CDBG annual action plan. Again, that is expected to be considered by the city council on June 23rd. And three, direct staff to use CDBG CV, which is for COVID, 
funds for a grant program to be distributed to microenterprise businesses and small businesses. With that, that concludes the presentation. I am happy to take um, questions. We do have Dennis King, Executive Director of Enterprise Foundation with us today in case you have any questions. And I believe Sharon Goey uh, is with us as well if there's any CDBG type uh, inquiries. With that, Mayor. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, I always know when you're coming to a conclusion of the presentation when you say, with that, and <laughs> I, I always, it, that rings through my mind uh, on off days as well, you know, thinking about Alex, but um, no, thank you so much. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, you know, it's good to see this item come back. I know we had uh, discussed the uh, kind of the funding uh, portion of it. I think there's no doubt about the actual program. It's just the funding of it. And I want to thank uh, Alex, you for your work with our subcommittee uh, chair, uh, Montano and uh, council member Dominguez. I, I tune in to the meetings uh, uh, as a spectator uh, without comment and due to the Brown Act. I see there's, um, I know Chris, uh, my voice is going through Chris's mind. He's listening now. <laughs> I did that to get your attention. Um, but I know you're always paying attention. But, uh, no, but it's really great work. I really um, am thankful for the leadership of both members on the uh, committee for uh, their commitment, their um, efforts, along with staff equally to um, spend time and discussion on it, critical thinking about uh, the program. Uh, and I think that this is going to be a really smooth program for our community. And it's really going to show us what the possibilities are here in town for our small businesses. Um, uh, we brought this item back. And so, uh, uh, you know, it's be, uh, good to hear uh, kind of some um, uh, more final comments from my colleagues about this. So uh, Vice Mayor Nunez. Yes, thank you. Let me lower my hand here real quick. Um, so you know, I thank you for all the additional work um, uh, you did um, to bring it to this end. And um, so first, uh, we did meet the CDBG um, subcommittee and looked at the $200,000 um, we do have to get uh, the Mopedis uh, small businesses back on their feet. There's a number that sticks in my head, uh, Alex. I think it's the 47% um, you said of small businesses that have really just vanished. They're gone. Um, they couldn't wait. They couldn't hold themselves here. We can't allow that number to grow. Um, so we do need to get this up and running. Um, I thank uh, both uh, the council members on this subcommittee to bring it to this point. Um, I, as I look at this, um, um, I know that we broke it up into two different types of loans um, and I'm, I'm supportive of that, whatever we need to do, the different sizes. Um, um, listening to um, the Chamber of Commerce uh, reminding me that um, there really are more businesses in Milpitas than just restaurants. You know, there are some that are just one person in an office, um, uh, others that require um, other kinds of loans and such. So, uh, I think uh, everyone's done a great job in trying to put this all together. Um, if you could put that last slide back up, that's um, maybe we took it away too quick or maybe just on my slide, it went away. Yeah, Vice Mayor, while we're doing that, I do there. want to clarify, you did mention the 47% of businesses vanishing. Just a, a clarification, our business sure. survey did indicate 48% of businesses who have closed, closed because they were non-essential businesses. My hope is that when we reopen the economy, that the percentage is not that high of businesses that have actually had to permanently close. We don't have that data just yet. 
uh, but we will be working with real estate um, professionals and we'll obviously get a better understanding of the vacancy rates. Um, but we, we hope it's much lower than 47%. Good. And I hope so too. And um, you just tell me what number to hold you to. And I'll be more than happy to do that. <laughs> um, so my, my only uh, question, there's two. One is I want to make sure we have time uh, for council member uh, Dominguez's uh, other kinds of questions she had. Uh, but it's the, um, you started with this being a loan and now going to a grant. Um, I am um, uh, really quite fine uh, with the uh, rent relief being grants um, because I know that's difficult. Um, not, um, not supportive of these kind of programs, the lo loan programs being grants simply because we're giving them to businesses that are actually gonna be making money. Um, so they're gonna be able to pay these back and it doesn't have to be some, we can, we can adjust the payments back to us, correct? I mean, if they don't have to proceed with the a loan. month. Pardon me? Uh, uh, Vice Mayor, are you referring to a loan program or a grant program? No, no, the loan program. So what I'm saying is that I'm in favor of a loan program as opposed to a grant program, because these are businesses that are going to take these dollars to stay open and make money. Um, now, I don't expect them to make um, what they were making pre-COVID, but at the same time, my hope is that they will be making money. I don't uh, expect them to pay this off um, in a short period of time, but any dollars we get back, we are then able to put back into the system to loans to other businesses, um, uh, pay our own expenses, do other kinds of trainings. I think we can use the dollars that come back to us through this process um, to continue to help small businesses in Milpitas. Um, I would not say that about the rent relief program uh, because these are persons that are, um, are unable to pay their own rent. So. I understand how uh, we, we would be looking at trying to make sure we can forgive some of those. So in this case, I, I know what we said last time was we we're gonna send this out um, uh, to look into other loan programs. It came back as a grant. Um, I would rather keep it as a loan program. And my understanding, uh, and Chris, you correct me if I'm wrong, this can be either way, correct? So the CDBG, my understanding is yes, the CDBG COVID CV funding can be used for small business loans or grants. Right. And so that the only downside I heard you describe, Alex, is that it is more work for us. But at the same time, the payoff for us is that we get dollars back. And so that moving forward, uh, we could look at this as, as self-funding itself going forward. Um, and therefore leaving more dollars for residents that are finding it difficult um, because they're out of work. Uh, they need assistance with housing and other services. And these are the dollars we could continue using going forward as opposed to trying to continue to fund uh, things for small businesses because they could use the, the loan payments. So I'm in favor of everything you have here I just like to continue using it in a loan program as opposed to a grant program. So th that's what I have to say, uh, but I think it's great work. Um, uh, and I thank you for all the time and effort you put into it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor. And next up with the virtual raise hand, we have Council Member Montano. Thank you, Mayor Tran. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I switched. I was using my personal computer, but you know, I, I, I'm not a techie, <laughs> so so I went back to the city uh, uh, laptop. So now you can see me. Um, so so let me get this straight. Uh, I, from my understanding, CDBG Community Development Block Grant was given supplemental um, income to cities 
to help with, uh, because of COVID, you know, help with rent relief, help with small businesses and, and a few other um, items. Um, so I think it's 397,000. So rounding it off is 400,000. So what you're saying is out of that CDB, those C, that supplemental CDBG funds, 200 for small businesses and hopefully 200 for uh, rent relief because at our last housing subcommittee, there, were, there was a substantial waiting list and um, that's why we, we decided to re reduce it because the average uh, uh, cost that people were asking for was 3,500. So in order to, um, even though I'm going up to the side, in order to, uh, uh, to, to help more people, we decided 5K to 3,500. That, that was to help more people. But with this um, 200 for rent relief, hopefully we'll, we'll, we can do that in 200 with the, but my main thing is, which is the fastest way to get money in the hands of the business community? Is it with the loan or is it with a, um, or with a grant? Because at this point, you know, I don't care what, what if it's a grant or a loan, I just want, I, we, they need to, they should have been helped yesterday. So wherever, um, whatever is the fastest way to get the money in their hands, that's the way I'm going. And I think, I think uh, uh, Vice Mayor Nunez said it was the loan, the loan uh, would probably be the fastest way. So I will, I will go with whatever, whatever is the fastest way. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Montano. Um, May I respond, Mayor? Yes, yes, I was looking to you. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Montano. The, the research that we have been doing is really telling us that there are more and more cities that are using CDBG funding. Again, South San Francisco, Fremont, uh, Gilroy, and Cupertino. And um, there are at least three, Gilroy, Cupertino, and Fremont, that are opting to do the grant program. Um, it is, according to them, quicker, and it's just, it's less laborious. It'll help staff and it'll help, obviously, um, Enterprise Foundation and Dennis's team. Uh, so that's what we're finding. Um, there, there's variations in different programs. Some are doing lottery, others are doing, um, you know, point system in terms of dollars getting out. We have been hearing from various representatives of those cities that they believe it's faster and their respective decision makers have um, that termination as well. Okay, so I'm going to go with whatever, the way I'm going to vote is whatever way is the fastest way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Montano. Next up here, we have Councilmember Fan. Yeah, I, um, I my my preference for, for this item um, is that it, it should be a, a loan program instead of a a grant, uh, and um, the, the reason is um, the CDBG is not just for um, businesses. It's a very limited uh, pool of funding, uh, and uh, that source of funding, um, you know, if, if this was uh, for uh, nonprofits uh, working on uh, housing or nonprofits working on um, domestic violence, for example, um, then, you know, that, well, I'm all for um, uh, using those funds as a grant for, for, for these uh, very service uh, specific um, organizations. Um, but in terms of uh, businesses, um, I, I think that um, the, the loan program itself is already a, a tremendous support, uh, support system um, in, in partnerships with uh, a number of other initiatives um, that uh, the, the state and federal government ha has lined up. So um, uh, to just sum it up, um, I, I prefer it to be a, a loan. Thank you very much, Council, uh, Council Member Fan. And um, I see your virtual raised hand if you can help us. Well, yeah, I think um, early discussions that we had was it was more of a loan. And I think one of the greater purposes for that was to, if we can recoup the money, it was going to be able to help out uh, additional businesses uh, and help out more people. And so I definitely hear what you're saying, Councilmember Fan. If, if it were a, a loan program, then the money that would go back uh, to the city from the business that used it successfully, it 
we had explored about that, um, being able to help even more businesses. So that's that's something just to think about. I'm just, um, um, you know, want to add that to the discussion. Uh, but it is a grant at this time. Vice Mayor Nunez, yes. Um, yes. Good. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I would rather, I, I think the money can um, be lent out. The timing is that could actually be the same because it's all about being repaid or just gifting it. And I think uh, Councilman Fan is correct. Um, if we give this 200,000 out and then we want to do something again, um, we have to take 200,000 or whatever that amount is out of the uh, next allotment we get from CDBG as opposed to giving services um, to residents. And uh, what I'd rather do is see if we couldn't um, collect some of these dollars back. The additional work you're talking about isn't on our staff, is it Alex? Because actually we're contracting that work out. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Yes, we're, we're having discussions with Dennis King. Visions as to who's doing what. Um, we, we do have uh, Mr. King with us, I believe, so we can always ask him, but we, from a staff perspective, are going to be relying on our fiscal agent to be assisting on the administration side sure. of it. So, uh, so I trust um, Alec, um, Alex, both you and uh, Dennis to work those things out. I, I just believe that the dollars really, as I see it, the first time we need to be able to be helpful, we also can be helpful by looking at some of those other areas um, that the Chamber of Commerce talked about, that the city um, could look at. Um, and so I don't want to bring those up because I know uh, Council Member Dominguez is going to. But uh, if we're going to make um, inroads into trying to help small businesses, um, this loan program is just one of those ways. There'll be other ways to do that. Um, the city can do, but I, I would hope that we look at CDBG as um, just one vehicle to do it, but that since this um, is really has always been used to bring services in for residents, that we, we continue to do that uh, to help those most in need individuals. Um, but as a startup, as, as trying to uh, uh, at least begin helping small businesses, let's do that. If it's a little additional work, um, um, that doesn't mean that we don't use some of our own dollars uh, to start with because it is in fact helping persons that either work here or reside here. But it doesn't have to be solely funded by outside dollars. So that's, that's my point. I just think that the, and I'm trying to make sure I address uh, Council Member Montano's point, what can get out the fastest? They both can get out the fastest. The, the timing um, is not gonna be determined by grant or loan. Um, it is, um, the work is the work. I think it is the other part, which is, do we want to use some of those dollars that are remaining to continue to help residents uh, that are in need? Or um, do we want to put it um, into small businesses with no ability to have a return? That's all. So that's my point of view. I hear you, uh, Vice Mayor Nunez. Uh, thank you for continuing the discussion. Uh, and so we have another virtual raised hand. And after this member, I'd like to go to our city clerk, uh, Mary Lavelle, uh, for public comment. Um, before that, let's go to council member Dominguez. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, and so I definitely wanted to thank um, the vice mayor as well. I know um, I, I do thank you for all of your engagements and 
for joining us. Uh, <laughs> it's always great to be with you guys, even when we can't talk. But I appreciate these moments that we have. Again, I just want to share, again, I'm taking some of my notes from meetings from with constituents. And I don't want to fail to emphasize three other components that they have. Um, and I know that they're not at the recommendation today, but as um, talked about earlier, um, one of them is the fees. And so again, I'm not too sure what fees they are refraining, referring to, but this is something that I would like to see if there's anything that we could waive, um, even if it's just for a small six month duration to help them. Um, many of them are stuck already with 30,000 more of rent. And so anything that we could do to support them while they get back on their feet would be appreciated. I want to thank staff for ex, uh, expediting the outdoor um, dining program. It's been a huge hit. And so thank you guys so much. I know, Ned, your team has been awesome. Um, thank you all for, for uh, expediting that. The other thing that they have shared is a buy local campaign that they would really want the city to support. Again, it's, it's not in the recommendations, but these are things that have been brought to my attention as well as the Milpitas Plates Program, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Phase two of the San Jose Plates Program, which is using, um, using home-based small business restaurants to help feed our needy families. So um, I don't know how that could happen, but I definitely wanted to bring it up to your attention um, and hope that we could move some way after we hear the public um, on their questions and concerns. But I thank all of you for your kind attention and for your rec uh, consideration of these additions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we'll go to our, oh, let me pause for one moment here. I do see a virtual hand. Uh, we'll go to Councilor Montano and then go to public comment. Yes. Oh, just a, a comment on, um, on Council Member Dominguez's um, comment on um, buy local. Uh, I did have Chris, uh, our city attorney, look into that, and maybe he might want to shed some light on that. Uh, I don't know if you want to do that now or. And I'm happy to um, just okay. share more with the council, um, Councilmember Montano and Councilmember Dominguez, and obviously the rest of the council. Um, yes, we per Councilmember Montano's request. There was a question that came to me just whether we could um, essentially buy things from the local community without doing obviously the bidding and, and all of those requirements. Our purchasing ordinance does detail that um, we can buy essentially supplies. Um, depending on dollar amount, we would have to do some sort of bidding, uh, whether it be an actual formal bid or whether it would just be getting three quotes. Um, but what our municipal code does indicate is that yes, we when we do do the, the bidding and do get quotes, that uh, a local business gets a preference in that process. It doesn't mean that they get selected automatically, but if they compete and go through the process, um, we are allowed to give them a preference in the process. And so um, I would encourage if, if we go a certain direction that that would, that would be followed because that is in our municipal code. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. So any, um, I know I've spoken to a few business owners and, um, and hopefully they, they, they're listening so they could uh, reach out to the city. So thank you so much for that. Right, thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. But I also want to emphasize that um, the Buy Local would also be um, an assisting marketing campaign with what we, what I would hope would be a, co a collaboration and partnership with our chamber um, to help promote uh, Buy Local. So that's a great example. That would be part of it, but just to provide some clarification for the council that that's um, a piece of what they are asking. Um, but definitely, um, thank you so much, Chair, for, for looking into that. I really appreciate it because I know that you've also been um, speaking with our small businesses. And so that's really important. Um, so I hope that the chamber is listening. So, <laughs> so um, uh, I'm not too sure, Chris, and help me. <laughs> Would that be something we could add into the recommendations now, or do we go to public for the public hearing? Mayor, I apologize. Maybe you could help me. Well, this is not a public hearing. Uh... Oh, thank you. Okay, so would it be something we would add to the we could add to the recommendations? Well, let's um let me pause you there, Council Member Dominguez, because. Uh, I do want to receive the public comment here. Oh, that's what it is. Thank you very much, Mayor.
are you ready, Mayor, for me to read yes, the comments? Yes, please. Yes, yes. That was your segue. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wasn't sure. Thank you. There are uh, two comments here. <clears throat> the first comment you have is from Chris Rios, 1775 Millmont Drive, Milpitas. He says, great. So you want to take money away from homelessness prevention programs and divert it directly to corporations. Do we have that right? This council likes to whine and complain about a few hundred thousand dollars. And meanwhile, the Milpitas Police Department is actively hiring more enforcement, spending money on huge billboard signs. How does that look? That's disgusting. You voted to increase the police department budget to more than $40 million, but cannot spare even a fraction of that money for residential issues, education issues, or healthcare issues. That's abhorrent. Don't call yourselves people of God because actions like this show nothing but your worship of force, brutality, and subjugation. Meanwhile, people are going homeless, being abused by landlords, racking up insurmountable debt in the midst of a pandemic, and you have the gall to give businesses grant money. What about residential citizens? What about renters? Sure, you can say we apply it to them as well, but actually do it. Create the plan to apply this funding to residents now. Your failure to act is depressing when we have to appeal to county council to actually save the lives of Milpitas citizens. We pay your salary, correct? So do your job. Okay. Next comment on this item is from Voltaire Montemayor, 669 Penitentia Street, Milpitas. Please grant or approve. Any seemingly contingent help is very much appreciated, especially by within criteria businesses. Thank you. A couple more messages have come in after this. Let me check if they're for this item or something else. Yes, please. Here's another one for this topic number 20 from Irvish Meta PO box address in Milpitas. Two Milpitas City Council members, small loan program and CDBG program are both funded by US Department of Her Urban and Housing Agency. It is important to implement the program as during the pandemic to help the city of Milpitas. And there is one more comment on this matter. The next comment is from Thomas Valori, 670 Cardiff Place. What conditions must be satisfied to be awarded a grant slash loan and who makes the determination? That's your last comment on this matter. Thank you very much, Mary, and uh, appreciate the public comments. Uh, that's all the public comments for this item. I wanna kind of follow up on, I think, Mr. Rios' comment. I'm probably at home watching right now. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I see what you did there about the funding, uh, financial management, and what we're doing here in town. I I do want to um, kind of uh, clarify that this is for, this program is for small businesses. It's not going to corporations. So let's take it easy, please. I know uh, you have a lot of concerns, and we're here for you. That's what the meeting's for. That's what we're here for every day of the year. But, again, this is a small business program. We do have parameters in place, uh, such as Mr. Valori's comment as well. We have been working on this uh, subcommittee and staff especially uh, for several weeks, really, since the onset of the pandemic. And so... Uh, those are things that we've covered extensively and will continue to cover. I um, know the Milpitas Beat local paper has actually also written about it. So there should be no confusion, Mr. Rios. Uh, furthermore, uh, our city has taken action, our city council, Milpitas Assistance Program, uh, the uh, housing subcommittee, which I voted for. And so... Um, social services and uh, rent relief. That is uh, things that we have been doing and actually think the next item on our agenda uh, refers to uh, more services. So I appreciate the comments, but I'll always uh, really support my colleagues in our city for um, truly 
doing uh, their uh, best uh, for the public service of our town. So um, I appreciate you. Uh, and I hope you'll stick with us if you're new to our public affairs. This is it. You're in the right place. If you've been with us for your whole life, then uh, I have faith that you'll continue to believe in the work that we have approved of you. And so back to the dais here, virtual dais. Uh, I see my uh, council colleagues here. I do want to go to our director of economic development, Alex Andrade. I do see you virtually. Thank you, Mayor. Just wanted to respond to the the thought and the question about um, assisting businesses and in, in full uh, transparency, we have, we being the Office of Economic Development through our Virtual Business Assistance Center, we have been in communication with well over 200 business representatives and we have received questions about, you know, utilities deferrals, uh, business license deferrals, uh, permit fees. There's been several questions about minimum wage, which wouldn't be necessarily a subsidy, but on July 1st, there's supposed to be a 40 cent increase per hour. Um, also, we've had conversations with a couple of hotel brands that have inquired about a transit occupancy tax rebate. So we, we from the Office of Economic Development have been receiving those types of inquiries as well. Um, the Chamber of Commerce has also been vocal about some of those. So I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that information. Thank you. Very well. Thank you very much, Alex. Back uh, to the dais here. Uh, next up with the virtual raised hand, uh, as you can see in the participants column, Council Member Montano. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to lower my hand. <laughs> sorry. Well, we see it. And so, all right, moving here to Vice Mayor Nunez. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me try to lower that. Okay. Um, so first, Alex, I have to tell you that I have heard from every business that uh, has contacted me or that I've been out to um, that they have been contacted by your office or by you and trying to provide assistance, um, um, all kinds of assistance. And, and I think it would be good if um, we could see some of that because I, you know, one of the things I always worry that we're giving you suggestions that you've heard and acted on, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 times. And then you, you're kind enough to give us that smile right there and not to embarrass us by saying, okay, I'll look into that. Knowing you've already done it 50 times, but and so I appreciate that. Um, and it's mostly because we're all trying to be helpful. Um, uh, so what I'm gonna try to do is at least put together a motion um, to approve the, and I'm trying to go by what's here, approve the Milpita Small Business Loan Program, direct staff to include $200,000 in community development block grant funds in the Milpita Small Business Loan Program as part of the approved CDBG Annual Action Plan. Direct staff to use CDBG CV funds for a loan program to be distributed in microenterprise business and small businesses. A new number four that said to take those additional ideas that were mentioned in tonight's um, council discussion by council members um, and see if um, those that have not been already um, um, reviewed by you, any new ones that you heard tonight, to see if they can be um, moved forward either administratively or those that need to come back to us for implementation in the city and the business community. Um, that would be my recommendation. Second. Uh, motion. Okay. All right, we got a motion by Vice Mayor Nunez. You have a second by Council Member Montano. Uh, all in favor virtually with a vote. Yeah, Council Member Fan. Aye. Uh, Council Member Montano. Aye. Council Member Dominguez. Aye. Vice Mayor Nunez. Aye. 
and myself is an I. The motion is carried and approved. Uh, Alex, the... thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Alex. That was great. Okay. Your vice mayor and council. Going here. Yeah. Okay. Next up here under community development, receive a report on the pilot rent relief program and provide direction for funding and program changes. Okay. And we have our director of uh, building um, and safety, Alex Sharon. Yes. A building and housing. Let me just get it right here. I, Still getting used to it, you know. It's been a year, I think. I'm still getting used to it. Building and Housing Department, yes. Dr. Sharon Go, yes. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council. Um, tonight, yeah, we'll be giving you an update on the pilot rent relief program and seek your direction for funding and program changes. Next slide. Okay. Uh, just for background, on October 15, 2019, the City Council authorized the creation of the Pilot Rent Relief Program, which allocated $100,000 in financial assistance from the Affordable Housing Fund to Milpitas residents and families that have emergency housing needs. On March 3rd, staff presented an update to the City Council on the program. Um, and the council allocated an additional 100000 from the Affordable Housing Fund. The Silicon Valley Independent Living Center has been administering the program, uh, and they've been performing the intake of the application, um, speaking to applicants, uh, helping them with the um, household budget worksheet, doing case management work, providing referrals to other nonprofit agencies as needed, and doing record keeping, providing reports, and distributing funds directly to the landlords. Um, and Sherry Burns, who is the executive director of Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, uh, she's available to answer questions on this call as well. Next slide. Um, this is just for background, um, when the program was established last year, these were the list of eligible recipients under the program. And we have been giving a lot of assistance to low and moderate income families with children, and seniors, disabled individuals, and victims of domestic violence. Next slide. Uh, and this is a review of the program as well. These are the types of available assistance under the program that was established last year. That includes um, rent deposit relief, emergency hardship relief, eviction prevention, uh, domestic violence relocation, uh, family homelessness relief, and Section 8 and face deposit. Next slide. Okay. Um, the program. Um, started in November, so referrals started back in November 2019. And uh, as of June 4th, the Pilot Room Relief Program has cumulatively allocated $183,839. And these funds represent assistance for 37 households with 130 residents. And you can really see the effects of COVID-19 in the last few months. 25 of the 37 households assisted for rent relief, they have come in after the shelter in place order took place in the middle of March uh, 2020. And between the report we received from Silicon Valley Independent Living Center on May 20th and June 4th, um, we saw a significant surge in the assistance requests, uh, where the rate of the assistance allocation uh, almost doubled. Um, so when we had originally um, planned on coming to council today, we had anticipated a little bit more in the balance, um, but just the last two weeks, based on the latest data, there was a big surge in the assistance request. Uh, so, you know, um, at least we're still in front of you tonight, and 
um, to uh, seek your direction for the funding. Next slide. Okay. Um, this is just a, a kind of an overview of the regional response as a result of the rapid increase in the rental assistance request uh, due to COVID-19. So the re uh, region has responded in a variety of ways. Uh, in line with the state, the San Juan County has extended the eviction moratorium through July 28, 2020. And this eviction moratorium prevents residents from being evicted due to COVID-19 related hardship. Uh, many renters have been struggling to pay their current rent already. So we anticipate displacement uh, to increase and also rent relief requests to increase. Uh, and on the rent relief effort on a regional basis, um, there was fundraising by private corporations, uh, mainly high-tech firms, um, that was conducted by Destination Home, and they created the COVID-19 Financial Assistance Program that's administered by Sacred Heart. Now, during the first phase, they had raised $11 million that assisted approximately 4,000 households across the county, and about 3% uh, of that was distributed to Milpitas households. And the phase two is underway right now, and they have raised $14 million. Um, and they're working on distributing these to the most needy uh, families. So that really uh, shows the need in the region. Uh, uh, can I ask a question? So the people yes. that, that have been affected, they, they contact the rent relief program, they contact the city, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, on the at the housing subcommittee on June fourth, um, the housing subcommittee had talked about looking at the rent relief assistance amount. As originally established in the program, the maximum amount of, of rent relief is five thousand dollars per household. Uh, and the exceptions for foster children, homeless families with school age children, and victims of domestic violence, that they are not subject to the maximum amount. Given the subcommittee's desire to fund as many households as possible, uh, a recommendation was made to cap the rent relief at 3500 per household. Uh, and um, still allowing the foster children, homeless families with school age children and victims of domestic violence not to be subject to the maximum. Uh, and limiting the maximum assistance uh, could allow more households to benefit from the program and extend the period for the available assistance. As mentioned above, um, Signal Valley Independent Center has been administering the program for us. And right now, they have a list of folks that are in queue uh, waiting to be, whose applications are waiting to be processed. And the estimate for the total amount of requests of, is approximately $100,000. And to continue funding after this current list, Based on that recent rate of assistance that I had mentioned earlier, um, where we saw a surge, and also the estimates from SVILC, uh, another $241,400 was estimated to, do, to be needed for approximately four to five months to November 2020. I uh, just want to note that this is a rough estimate because there are many factors in the region, in the economy, in the state and county directive that can affect the amount of the rent relief needs. Um, so with that, the total amount um, that is um, recommended to council to allocate to the pilot rent relief program is $341,700. Um, during this you know, COVID-19, um, the situation is pretty fluid. 
so staff will continue to monitor the status and provide updates to council. Thank you so much, Sharon. Is, uh, mm -hmm. This looks like the last uh, slide next, here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's more. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh, sure. I was um, okay. Carry um, on. So, um, okay. The initial 200000 that was allocated to the pilot rent relief program, that was funded through the Affordable Housing Fund. Um, and you know, as we've heard um, during the last couple of meetings and just the last item as well, the city has received um, CDBG funding. Our formula funds for fiscal year 2021 is $676,413. And as, as a result, the Federal CARES Act the city was also allocated a supplemental coronavirus funding, or it's called CDBGCV funds, in the amount of $397,911. Um, and um, staff has also been able to actually secure additional funding from prior years, from uh, fiscal year 14, 15 through 18, 19, that total $290,039. Uh, dollars um, that could be used for COVID-19 related activities as well. So the total funding, oh, okay, I can talk about on this slide. Yeah, so to date, 200,000 has been allocated from the Affordable Housing Fund and for the total of $341,400, um, there is sufficient funding through either the CDBG allocation or the Affordable Housing Fund. From the Housing Subcommittee discussion, um, they preferred funding with CDBG allocations. And in order to preserve city funds, um, staff uh, believes that would be um, a better alternative too. Uh, but it is ultimately the council's decision and um, because of the, um, that HUD would like to give city access to CDBG CV funds uh, rapidly, after we go to council, hopefully next Tuesday on, December, um, on June 23rd for CDBG allocation, and two weeks after that, we'll be able to receive the CDBG CV funding. Um, so I would recommend that portion of the 341,000 comes from the uh, CD funding first, and then the remainder uh, from the prior years. Yeah. And if you need an exact amount, we kind of did that at the CDBG committee meeting yesterday. Um, the breakdown would be 118,000 from the CDBG CV bucket and then 223,000 from the prior years. And this is so that the 118,000, we could have a, a quick access to that. All right. Um, at the June 4th housing, oh, go ahead, did you have a question? Uh, you at our, at our housing subcommittee, you mentioned that there was a, a large waiting list and growing. Uh, how many, how, is that gonna come up or is that, uh, or do you, can you yeah, say that now? That the, okay. Yeah, that was the 100,000 mentioned earlier. It's part of the total of 341,000. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, another topic the housing subcommittee talked about on June 4th was that since the program has assisted 37 households with 130 residents total, um, they thought the council can discuss whether to remove the word pilot from the name of the program. So we're seeking your direction on that tonight as well. Next slide. Um, and the housing subcommittee also wanted to better understand the Economic Development Corporation as a potential solution in the future to help accomplish city council goals and objectives 
And the city attorney has provided a memo on that. Uh, and Chris can speak more about this um, if you would like him to. Otherwise, yeah, my Chris. next slide. Yeah. Okay, Chris. Yes, your next slide. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll just talk quickly about the Economic Development Corporation. Uh, it is something that's existed at the city since 2011. Um, it was something that was established initially uh, to deal with the outfall of redevelopment from my understanding, but the Economic Development Corporation does exist today. It is a nonprofit public benefit corporation. Uh, essentially, the city council sits as the board of directors um, with city staff essentially filling roles uh, with the Economic Development Corporation um, and with the city attorney as corporate counsel, our city manager as executive director, um, and it carries on from there. Um, but what the Economic Development Corporation does have is very clear language within the Articles of Incorporation that detail what it was set up for. And so I'll give you a description of some of those um, provisions. Um, it talks about the Economic Development Corporation uh, developing affordable housing for low and moderate income persons, applying private and public funding sources to combat blight and deterior deterioration in the city, uh, stimulating economic development, upgrading, replacing, and constructing improvements and infrastructure within the city, expanding employment opportunities, and soliciting and receiving grants, contributions, donations, and gifts, including personal and real property. Um, really what this was set up for at the time, from my understanding, uh, was to try to bring in private money to deal with the financial loss that the city was gonna face um, with the redevelopment wind down occurring. Um, but it exists today, and I, it was something that uh, Councilman Montano did ask me about uh, a few weeks or maybe even months ago at this point. Um, but uh, the memo is there in your packet just to provide more guidance. Um, but the staff is happy to take any direction you may have on the, on the corporation itself. But thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. I think that's uh, well and, and good and uh, it is a potential solution. So that's good. Let's keep the potential going. Uh, back to Sharon, please. Um, yeah, so our last slide is the recommendation slide. Um, to receive report on the pilot grant relief program and uh, give us direction whether to modify the maximum assistance from 5,000 to 3,500 3, per household um, and provide direction on the funding amount and the funding source for the program. Um, and depending on number three, to authorize the city manager to amend or prepare agreement. Uh, and the number five is whether to remove the word pilot from the name of the program. Uh, and then the last is to provide direction on Economic Development Corporation. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sharon, for the presentation. Um, certainly an item I think we're all happy to see come back to the virtual chamber. Um, and really thank you to the housing subcommittee one of the early subcommittees that was formed uh, by this group of members on this council. So uh, just I'm very uh, pleased uh, I am to um, see the leadership from my colleagues. Um, I think everything's great. I'm, I'm gonna be supporting all the recommendations. It was uh, very clearly described uh, and explained. Um, I guess one question I have for this evening um, is the effectiveness of the program, um, but these are longer term um, kind of um, evidence or data I'd like to see come back from the uh, two dozen plus or three dozen, I think 37, three dozen, um, recipients of the rent relief. Um, I'd like to see some long-term numbers, uh, maybe six months or 12 months as to where these people, uh, residents, community members are. Um, I, I hope that the dollars that are going towards uh, the uh, cost of living for families here in Milpitas are, are having a long-term effect and um, it is, a, I think, a substantial amount for us to be, uh, as a city, spending on 
rent uh, relief. Um, not, and I'm fully behind Ed, but if I like to ask Sharon or or administrator over at the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center to collect data and follow up with folks, I'd hate to um, support families and then not really know where they're at months later. Um, that would be really, I think, helpful for our leadership across the chamber to, to understand more of the value of these dollars. So I guess that's my only ask. Um, and I, and I hope that the, or, you know, if the data already exists and that's great too, um, or if it's already in the framework, then that's great too. So um, but that's my thoughts on it. And so I'll go to my colleague, uh, council member Montano with the virtual thank raised you. hand. Yes. Thank you, Mayor Tran. Um, thank you, Sharon, for the, the, presentation. Uh, did Robert have anything to add to this? Um, no, no, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, so on number one, receive report. Uh, so you did a great job. Uh, number two, modify. And the reason why we, uh, Council, uh, Vice Mayor Nunez and I uh, uh, are recommending going from 5,000 to 3,500 is because uh, we were told um, by staff that the average ask is 3,500 and there's a wait, a huge waiting list. And so we wanna help as many families as possible. So that's why we're recommending uh, 3,500 uh, instead of the 5,000. So we could help more people uh, with uh, rent relief. And then number three, <clears throat> designate funding amounts and sources for the program. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the council will designate that funding because it. This program has really uh, been a vanguard from its very inception um, before COVID. Uh, now that COVID is here, it's you see many many cities are scrambling to put a program like this in place, whereas we already had one uh, back last year. So, I'm I'm so I'm so thankful that the council uh, approved uh, this um, rent relief program uh, with the, well, created this uh, housing subcommittee and uh, the rent relief program. Uh, also, um, for authorized city manager to men to prepare agreement uh, with Independent Living Center, they have been doing a fantastic job of helping uh, our Milpitas residents that are uh, hurting. And also I would like to recommend to remove the pilot because we're, we're not a pilot anymore. We're actually doing, uh, a lot of great things for our community. And, uh, and then on the Economic Development Corporation, if we had this in place already, we could have given grants. Uh, the city, I'm not sure if you, the public knows this, but cities cannot give out, especially general law cities, we cannot give out grants. It's, it's against our, um, we're, not, we're not allowed to. Um, so, if we already had this in place at Economic Development Corporation, we would have been able to give up grants to help our small businesses and do a lot more creative things, uh, even with housing, but our hands are tied. And if we create this vehicle, Economic Development Corporation, if, oh, it's already here, but if we move it forward, we can do so many great things uh, for the long term. And I'm hoping that uh, the council will uh, uh, you know, move forward because we, we will be the, um, the board of directors, if you will. And then um, hopefully having uh, Chris as the um, oversight and then um, maybe uh, selecting uh, a department that can you know, assist in this. But in the beginning, it'll go slow because we're, it's you know, just starting uh, to move, even though it's there, it's, everything's in place. It's just a matter of uh, being able to move in a concise way where we can ask corporations for gifts and to put it in that pot to help the community. So I'm really looking forward to this. This is, a, this is fantastic. And I'm glad that Chris, you, uh, you came across this. Um, when I, I had asked you to look into the, the other one, the, um, what was it that other nonprofit organization that uh, the Parks and Rec State Department had created, it was called uh, Festival of Lights, or for the Parks and Rec Department, but <laughs> then you then you then you stump, stumbled on this one, and I go, well, this is even better. And uh, I recall when I was on the console at the time when redevelopment was taken away, and cities were hurting so bad. And I'm glad that the 
that uh, the consul at the time had um, created this economic development corporation. And the purpose was to protect our assets, but the state took them away anyway. So, but at least something <laughs> that came out of it. Anyway, um, uh, that, that's all for now. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Montano. And we're gonna continue down the uh, column of uh, panelists. Uh, I just wanna mention briefly that we will be going to public comment. We're gonna receive those public comments after uh, we go through the dais here. Um, and so I would be um, faulty for not um, mm -hmm. recognizing that and letting folks know the discussion uh, will continue here. Next up, Vice Mayor Nunez. So thank you very much. I um, <clears throat> first wanna thank you, Sharon. Um, uh, Sharon must be the only person I know that works 26 hours a day um, doing all this work. I don't think she sleeps. Um, I don't think she leaves her computer. Uh, so just thank you. Now as being one of the recipients of all these reports, um, uh, sometimes I look and if I see that email is from Sharon, uh, I just close my iPad and walk away and hope she didn't notice that my iPad was open. Um, but um, I agree that it's time to take pilot off. Uh, I think that um, this is a program that's been um, copied by other cities and I think it's effective. I think um, the, uh, though, I, though I'm not sure I understand about the amend to prepare the agreements, I'm sure the city manager does and Silicon Valley Independent Living Center has been doing a great job in managing this uh, program for us. Um, Economic Development Corporation, um, Chris, I trust you to put whatever papers need to be in place. Uh, it's another tool for us to use and during these times, I think we need to have every tool available to us. Uh, and, and that one, the more I hear about it, uh, the more valuable it becomes. If you could go back to the slide, uh, Sharon or Mike, that showed um, how the dollars were initially spent. Um, there, I think that's it. Um, because this shows um, uh, that in is it, it the hundred thousand dollars we started with? Um, we needed to add to that, but now it looks like you know, just over the next few months we're going to need another two hundred forty-one thousand dollars, and I think we're lucky to be able to have that um, in our CDBG uh, dollars that are coming towards us. Um, and if you look at that date, November 2020, uh, to me, that's uh, what caused uh, concern on the part of myself and uh, Council Member uh, Dominguez um, and Council Member uh, Montano. I mean, uh, that is beyond the July 28th date. And so, Chris, maybe you can tell us um, why we can. Um, um, look at uh, dollars being spent beyond July 28th. No, thank you for the question, uh, Vice Mayor. Um, so if you're using the, uh, essentially the CDBG COVID funding, um, it's not tied to any particular date, but Sharon might wanna chime in if she has more knowledge than I do. Um, really the rent relief program is separate and distinct um, from anything dealing with the eviction moratoriums that are set by the county or the state. Um, the rent relief program truly is our program. Um, and if we're using general fund to fund aspects to it, um, then we could decide how that's used and how long that goes on in terms of the relief. Um, if we're using the CDBG uh, COVID funding, my understanding is as long as, as the use meets the qualifications set by the federal government, um, we can continue to fund um, as long as they allow us essentially or till that okay. funding runs out. Okay. So I, I think uh, that's why we can wait to those later dates in our um, um, 
this month in our city for our council meetings because we have that flexibility. So we're not going to, if the governor either extends it or sometime um, um, after, even after that, we can extend that date if we want to as a council and use these dollars to do it, correct? Chris? Uh, so long as there's still funding available. So if we're using okay. again, the CDBG COVID funding, there may be restrictions on you know the types of uses there may be restrictions on the duration, but my understanding, unless Sharon has other knowledge, um, so long as it's available and it can be used and we're meeting the requirements, I would assume that yes, you could go okay. further. So, um, uh, so once again, I go back to Sharon in that what she's, what she, what we're looking at tonight is really earmarking some of those dollars to get us at least through November 2020 for um, the rent relief for those that are there, uh, that are queued up and though the projections made by both Silicon Valley and by our own office. Um, and then what's gonna come to us in July, uh, or, or in our next meeting next week is the rest of the funding for, um, and the expenditures for CDBG. So there are two different committees that are, that are gonna be coming forward. Tonight is the housing committee. Next week, it's the CDBG um, to show how we are using those dollars to help um, the residents and those most in need. Part of that um, is um, not only helping with rent relief, like that's there today, uh, but Mayor, we took you up on some of your suggestions, which uh, is partnering with uh, MUSD and looking at um, a social worker or a social services unit that would be able to help um, the homeless youth that attend MUSD. Um, and I think, is this the chart, Sharon, that shows those? Um. There was one that you showed the students that we had helped before, or the all of, all of the families. No, uh, there's a table in a couple slides earlier. Okay. That shows the total number of households we yep, have assisted. That's it. Yes. Yeah. So I get extra, uh, if we can disaggregate that data. Yeah. That that, have. And that's what I want to be able to. Oh, there you go. Right there. Right yeah. there. Yeah. So yeah. this is this is a very rough one, Mayor, but this is the kind of data you were looking for. Yes. Domestic violence, foster youth. So right. they need to sort of take that out further because one of the requests was to really look at what we could do for the homeless youth, foster youth at MUSD. And and so they're on their way of doing that. Um, so in my mind, um, the, re the request being made is trying to still focus on not only the student, but that family unit um, and using the dollars from CDBG to do exactly that and extend it out into the community for that the whole family unit, if that's a, a mother, father, uh, significant uh, adult um, and other family members. So that in fact, we're looking at their housing, um, food, other kinds of things. And really all of that was done by Silicon Valley and by Sharon to make sure that uh, we're delivering um, to that family so that they were safe and secure within the city limits of Milpitas. And so I just wanted to make sure we thank Sharon and Silicon Valley and all the other nonprofits that are helping um, the families here in Milpitas. And we're trying to do more for them using these dollars. So I think that the recommendation is one that I can support um, because it, it's only improving in what we have been doing. And it's really all the work done by the nonprofits and by Sharon uh, and her unit. So thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, and next up here at the virtual raised hand, we're going to Council Member Dominguez. Thank you so much, Mayor. 
Um, and first and foremost, thank you so much for the subcommittee for all of their work. I know that this has been intense and Sharon, you are an angel on this earth for these families as well as the rest of our staff. I know Robert, you've been, your name has been coming back to me as well as a phenomenal staff member. So thank you both for, for and everyone who's, who's making this happen. Um, I'm reading the report and I just had a couple of questions for the subcommittee. Um, the report says that the average rent relief provided to an eligible recipient is $3,600. So I'm just trying to understand how come that wasn't the maximum for a household. If the average is 3,600, why did you guys do 3,500? Just trying to understand the logic behind that. To, uh, the, to help more people, that was it. I thought it was 3,500, but it, maybe it was 3,600, couldn't remember. The report says 3,600. Okay. So would you like to change that to 3,600? It depends on the council. If the council would like to make it to 3,600, that would be that would be fine too. Okay. Um, my next question to the subcommittee is, when I look at the numbers, and again, it's just trying to understand the logic just because I, I'll be honest, I work and it's, um, I can't watch the meetings all the time. Um, so I thank you both for your service on that committee. Um, so if a family comes, I, I guess, help me understand what the goal overall is for this committee. What, if you would have to say the goal in one sentence, what would it be? The goal is rent relief to help them to help them, help them uh, pay so, the rent. Well, do you have something to say, uh, I spare? Well, I would just direct you back to the um, mission statement and such of this program altogether. And I'd ask staff to pr provide you with that. Okay, staff, is, do you mind providing the goal of this program? I think um, it's a really, yeah. uh, uh, you know, this is an elementary question. I'm not sure what you're trying to get to, council member. It is, absolutely, Mayor. You just hit the, the nail on the coffin. It's an elementary question. So I just want to make sure that we're both under, that we're all understanding what the goal of the program is because it's going to help me understand the next question. So what I understood was the goal of the program is to provide rent relief to help displace displacement in Milpitas. Is, there, is that not the goal? or just want to make sure that's the goal? Well, all I can say is I looked at all of the uh, areas that were mm -hmm. included. There was actually more goals than just that. Okay, so that helps me. Thank you, Vice Mayor, for that You're answer. Welcome. You're welcome. Because it, that's exactly what I was looking for. Because if you're gonna tell me the goal was just to help displace families, then when I would just state that I would have an issue with minimizing the 5,000 right. to 3,500. First, because 3,600 is the average, but if we're trying to help pay the rent so this family won't get displaced, we're now in COVID month three. And so unfortunately what's happening with a lot of families, which I'm, I'm sure you're both aware of, is that there's no money coming in, therefore they can't pay the rent. So, the 3,500 or 3,600 wouldn't even be enough to cover probably one month's rent. And so therefore they would still get displaced. But since you answered that question, Vice Mayor, very thoughtfully, <laughs> I've learned that from you, <laughs> right? The goal is not to help displace, it's to help support, I'm mm -hmm. hearing. Okay, perfect. So if it's helping support, then I do understand how you're trying to maximize the assistance for more people in Milpitas. Um, I guess my question would just come though, if what if we had a family that needed, I don't know, 3,800? So um, one of the things that Sharon made a point of is if you were a family that were, I was in, correct me if I'm wrong, Sharon, a family that was uh, foster or homeless, then, then the rates, the, the limit didn't uh, apply to you. 
Okay. Um, and we did other things for you. Um, some of those may be put hosting you until we found, help find you a place, things of that sort. So, okay. Uh, Perfect. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor. We're starting to think the same because <laughs> you, that was my next question. So I thank you for that information. You're I just welcome. want to make sure um, that we're not, you know, I just want to make sure, and I'm sure you both talked about it. It's just, I don't want to add more bureaucracy to a system nope. that's going to take a roof away from someone that's currently being sheltered. And I think that's, that's my main concern. So I'm okay with um, one, I would like to kindly ask the, the committee to change 3,500 to 3,600 because that's the average based on the, on the report, if that's okay. That's fine with me. Okay, yeah, that's, and that's fine. Perfect, thank you so much, uh, Vice Mayor and Council Member Montano. Um, on the sixth one, Economic Development Corporation. I, I love that we could take grants I just want to learn a little bit more because I know that in other cities, when I looked into what the Economic Development Corporation does, it's a philanthropy arm to the city. And I just don't know. I worry we don't have the staff support to staff this in what it should look like. So I guess in providing direction it sounds like we're making stuff make it happen, but I would like the direction to come back to council before they make it happen. Cause I just want to make sure to know how much it's going to cost. It sounds like it's already there. So it is. Chris, so Chris, help me understand if Cisco came up to us and said, I have a million dollars, we could take that million dollars and put it into this economic development corporation, correct? The only limitation, um, it's a great question, Councilmember Dominguez, um, and I did share this with um, uh, Councilmember Montano, is we want to make sure that the IRS disclosures and anything that's been filed with the IRS is consistent with the scope and purpose as laid out in the bylaws. And if there was an issue there, we might have to do some refiling with the IRS. Mm -hmm. But based on the existing scope, it is pretty broad, so you could take in a donation. But but again, I think uh, to your point, we want to make sure that there's um, bodies there to obviously account for the money and make sure that it's being provided appropriately. Okay, perfect. So I guess in the direction, I would, if it's okay, I would like um, just kind of for this to come back to council before we move staff to implementation, I would like to see what it looks like. Well, and that's all we were asking for. That's what oh, okay, we were perfect. asking for. Yeah, that's all. Okay, I just want to yeah. make sure that that's the same. Again, just want to make sure I don't want to put more, and again, it's just pressure on staff. If it's already there and we could use it without staff, I mean, that's like the best, right? But I do know that philanthropy, it takes at least four bodies once it starts getting into, and the good thing is we don't have anybody right now. So we don't have that issue. <laughs> well, I didn't uh, even know we had it. So it's I, we do yeah. want to just take a look and see what is it. To start yeah, with. exactly. Right. You know, but once we get to that 100,000, then that's going to be different. So, right. um, okay. So as long as that's the direction, I'm okay. definitely okay with that. And okay, I'm okay good. with the recommendations. Just changing the 3,600 would be great. Thank you okay. very much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Dominguez. Uh, I um, also want to thank our city attorney, Chris Diaz, for uh, explaining uh, earlier on the slide there on Economic Development Corporation, the uh, finer details. Um, I, I do want to talk about the uh, 3,500 to 3,600. Um, maybe I should ask Sharon. Um, now, um, we have a certain budget and we do kind of sometimes simple division or less simple division. Um, how was that 3,500 determined when the average was slightly uh, more than that by just the, some dollars? Um, did we um, recommend the 3,500 uh, for mathematical purposes? Um, yeah, during the housing subcommittee meeting, 
Um, we had talked about the average about 3,600. Uh, and I think it was just more of a, you know, a, a more even number. Um, and that's how 3,500 came about. Okay, very well. Okay, um, thank you very much. All right, next up here, Council Member Fan. Yes, um, number of questions. Um, so uh, in terms of um, the numbers, uh, the logistics of um, our existing program and um, the people that have um, uh, qualified and, rece and, and received the, the relief funds, um, how, how, of those people, how many, um, were, or how many requested assistance um, above that 3,500 uh, amount? Because I, I, I know that the, the average is, is uh, what, 3,600 or so, but what's, what's the number um, of households? Um, yeah, I probably have to, um look at the spreadsheet in detail. And I know Sherry, you're on the line too. Um, she has all the details of the program and SVILC is the one managing that. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I don't, Sherry, I don't know, if, are you on the call? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Can, can you hear, okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Tran and city council members and staff. Um, yeah, so the the 37 households that were assisted, um, the ranges for assistance were anywhere from um, uh, low of $1,500 up to um, some of the rents were close to $5,000, again, depending upon if they were renting an apartment uh, or if they were renting a house because it was a larger family or multiple families living together. So it really was a wide range. And that's, if you just add them all together, the average ended up being 3,600 per family. The ones that right. we have on the wait list now, we have 13 families on a wait list and the um, amounts that their rents are range from a, a low of 1,200 for somebody who's in subsidized housing uh, up to uh, the largest amount, which is seven thousand dollars, but most of them are in the three to five thousand dollar range. Okay. Uh, well, I, I mean, probably not much we can do for the that seven thousand um, amount there. But um, you know, in, in terms of the actual number of people um, that lowering this amount would. Um, affect um you know they, there's only 30 there's 37 households right correct in, in, in total that that we assisted so you know whatever that range that may be then um you know you, sh you should still be able to provide the amount of households that are above 3500 um because i would imagine it would be a low um, a fairly low number in terms of the households. So I, I, I don't see why we don't have that data. And, and, and why I bring it up is, um, you know, I, I totally understand that um, we're, we're trying to um, assist as many families as possible. Um, but that said, we, I'd, I'd much rather us um, designate additional funding uh, rather than uh, to 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 lower that amount there, if they're if they're not um, meeting the five thousand dollar threshold, then that's just going to be rolled over in into the you know our our budget um, uh, predictions and and whatnot. But for for the people who um, aren't going to be able to um, have a place um, any longer uh, because uh, we we changed this program. I'm I'm very uncomfortable with that. And 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 so I I really would appreciate 
the actual number of people that would be affected because you know we have some very good folks um some of whom have spoken um you know during uh, public comment as to how um they are not um the, as to how their household um would would be affected as as to how much you know the current program has already assisted uh, their situation so you know that if it's the case that you know widespread nobody you know met that five thousand dollar threshold then yeah I'm, i'm comfortable with you know lowering it but if if you if you can't put a number as to how many families would be affected that's that's going to be a difficult conversation to have yeah this is sherry again and council member i appreciate mm-hmm. the question uh, based upon uh who is currently on our waiting list i can tell you that about 40 percent would be affected by lowering the threshold. Now we've got the situation that's constantly changing though with the fact of of the um, uh, recession and people still out of work and have delayed perhaps their rent payments. And that puts people in a whole different situation if in fact they owe more than one month's rent. So say the average rent uh, in the city of Milpitas is somewhere around you know $2,800 or so. If you've got two months rent, that's obviously going to put you above that thirty-six hundred dollars threshold, okay. and that's just a projection. Now, um, in terms of uh, the the funding source, um, I guess on the uh, Economic Development Corporation um, would would. Um, CDBG funds be able to uh, fund the um, an administration of uh, these um, initiatives. I uh, are you asking me the question or Sharon? <laughs> uh, anybody, anybody. <laughs> okay. the, the CDBG does allow for administration expenses and service expenses. Yes, on top of, of the pastoral direct service funding, but Sherry can give you a more specific uh, answer as far as what's allowed and what's not allowed. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, no, that, that that's so, helpful. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, was your question on? Um, The CDBG for the Economic Development Corporation. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll probably have to um, ask Chris to weigh in on that um, because I know he has looked into some of the, um, the you know, the documents that form the corporation and whether that needs to be amended first. Okay. Um, Thank you, Sharon. Um, Councilmember Fan, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I missed it. Yeah, no worries. It's um, whether or not uh, CDBG funds can be used to uh, fund the um, uh, administration um, of the um, uh, Economic Development Corporation. That's something we could look into. Um, my inclination is to say that unless we have a defined program that CDBG funding can be used for, um, it might not work just as a funding mechanism. Um, but I would imagine if we established a program that could potentially meet the parameters of CDBG, potentially you could have some funding go to the uh, EDC in that regard. I don't know if it could be used for general administration, but I'd be happy to work with Sharon to look into that. Okay. Um, Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that a economic development corporation um, should be formed, uh, but I, I want to make sure that um, you know we have a more in-depth discussion, maybe at a future meeting, as to uh, what um, its, um, I guess, uh, jurisdiction is um, as it relates to. Uh, funding as it relates to uh, relief um, and and you know other um, details um, I think that it, it does have the potential to uh, raise uh, funds 
for specific purposes and and uh, really assist um, the the city uh, it, in where we have uh, some shortfalls. Um, but I, I think that you know we should have a um, conversation as to um, you know it's uh, it's it's primary um, focus and and not to um, uh, I guess um, uh, stray away from that. Um, the other thing that I um, wa wanted to bring up um, is source of funding um is it possible for us to do a, a nexus study um to um um to do impact fees um and from that fund the rent relief program because i i, I think that um it's a program that you know we should be expanding i think nobody is uh is disputing that but um that that funding source or or rather that uh limited funding source is um what's the root of the the debate here so um is is that possible for us to um do impact fees or because i'm 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 trying to make sure that it's self sustaining um cuz right now uh the the program if i'm not mistaken it, it's 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 all funded by cdbg is, is is that correct no so far the program has been funded through the affordable housing fund okay which actually um you know is a combination of the in lieu fees um and the impact fees from non-residential construction so um would it be possible then to in increase the impact fees in order to fund um or or rather um in order to expand our affordable housing fund Um, that's something we'll have to look into because the fees were set as part of the affordable housing ordinance, and we you know, took that to council last um, March last year, um, and that was part of the you know, affordable housing ordinance uh, and the associated fees by for residential construction that was in new fees to meet the 15% um, requirement. And then for non-residential construction, that would be impact fees to meet the um, nexus study requirements. Uh, and if we were to do a separate study on the impact for the you know, rent relief, um, that's something we can look into, but uh, it's, you know, it's not something that can be done that quickly. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, but, but once um, the nexus is established, um, that, that fee, um, increase would rather just be a vote, right? Um, yeah, I mean, that's something, yeah, we'll have to study and, and look into. Okay, well, I, I'm, I'm just exploring options here. Um, okay, um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll just defer um, the rest of uh, the time to my uh, colleagues. Thanks uh, for your work on this, uh, Sharon and uh, staff and uh, the subcommittee. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Fan. And the virtual raised hands continue. Uh, I'm gonna go down the column here. I just wanna ensure folks are uh, have their hands up raised appropriately. Um, I know that uh, we're gonna continue the conversation, but I, if, if I may, I want to just uh, take a moment to take public comment and then we'll get back to our uh, elected officials here. Just wanna make sure we, we get the public comment in here. Um, uh, Mary, please. Okay, Mayor, there are six at least comments for me to read to you now. <clears throat> Here's the first one. Comment is from Allison McDonald, 672 Kevin Air Drive. I have several concerns. Number one, the housing subcommittee recommends cutting the maximum level of funding per family using the program from $5,000 to $3,500 
which is less than the average amount families have needed when they came for assistance. This will not cover what's needed to keep people housed. Number two, the recommendation is to fund the program with $341,400 of CDBG money through November. This number is based on the applications received prior to mid-May. Since that time, demand for assistance has doubled. No funding is allocated from the general fund this year. Number three, police have increased their estimated contacts with house, houseless residents of our community to 1,000 and taxpayers are being asked to spend up to $1 million to quote, clean encampments, unquote. Our police are getting $2 million more this year. Please allocate some of this money to prevent homelessness and provide more assistance to renters in need. As people are faced with paying back rent from months of unemployment, we will experience an avalanche of evictions. We need to do more to help. Thank you. Okay, next comment for you is from Chris Rios, 1775 Millmont Drive, Milpitas. I'm disappointed in the decisions of city council at a time when civil unrest is at its highest and people are demanding the reallocation of funds from police departments toward initiatives that benefit housing, education, and healthcare. This city council has failed to act appropriately. You should feel shame. How will this be looked at in six months, in six years? Residents are facing a crisis and in the coming months, my friends may be homeless. I've struggled and the grant of $5,000 from SVLC has saved my life and my family's life. Without that help, we would be homeless. Think about the many others that are in dire need of help. You're proposing decreasing the aid from 5,000 to 3,500 and improving, excuse me, imposing restrictions that make it near impossible for anyone to get the aid they rightfully deserve. Meanwhile, you're planning to increase the Milpitas police budget. Shame on you, shame on you and the optics this will have because clearly that's all you care about, the optics. Milpitas Police does not need some $40 million in funding. What we need is equitable housing solutions. We need to cure homelessness in Milpitas. We need to invest in student education. We need to invest in healthcare for everyone. I'm beyond mad, disappointed, and disgusted by the morals of this council in choosing to take money away from homeless, preventative measures and giving it to a growing police state. Your decisions this year will echo for decades to come. Mark those words. Next comment is from Yoli Garcia, 864 Founders Lane, Milpitas. I would like city council to extend the rental assistance program and keep the maximum assistance amount per household at $5,000. Thank you for your continued support for our community. Next comment is from Tiffany Vuong, Milpitas. Good evening, Mayor Tran, Vice Mayor Nunez and council members Dominguez, Montano and Fenn. The COVID-19 crisis is not just a public health issue. The economic impacts of COVID are being felt by many in the community, as some of you have pointed out earlier in the meeting. Layoffs and reduced hours at work also mean less money to pay rent and buy food or medicine. More, not fewer people need assistance at this time. How will families who are already living paycheck to paycheck before COVID catch up on all the back rent? Please do not cap assistance to $3,500. To better meet the needs of the community, we should allocate more funds to the rent relief program. Perhaps one starting point is the $1,266,000 raise that the police are getting. Okay, the next comment for you is from Juliana Brahm, 2052 Tiny Street. 
Tonight's agenda addresses the continuation of the rent relief program, but there's no funding amount or source named. I urge you to name and allocate specific funds to rental assistance to the families in our community who consistently face evictions. Next is from Voltaire Montemayor, 669 Penitentia Street, Milpitas. The modification on the figures are, I believed, to be because of the one, the law of supply and demand, sources of funds limits, two, priorities considerations, spreading the butter to more needy groups or individuals. The word, quote, pilot, unquote, could be retained. It is a hope of life to reach the ultimate goal. <clears throat> Next comment is from Irvish Meta with a PO box address in Milpitas. Two city council members. In November, 2019, the council approved a one-year pilot rent relief program that would set aside $100,000 to help a range of residents and families that have emergency housing needs either stay in their homes or find housing. The nonprofit Silicon Valley Independent Living Center ran the program for the city at an estimated service cost of $1,290 per referral. It is important to have city analysis and report for rent protection. Thanks, Irva Schmetta. And that is the last comment that's come in for this item, Mayor. Thank you very much, Mary. And that'll be it for public comment for this agenda item. I wanna thank all the community members that are engaged with us. Um, not, I just wanna uh, uh, take a moment here without mentioning any names, but I really love comments, you know, whether it's during the meeting here or on social media, uh, oftentimes on uh, different um, um, or polar uh, uh, views are, um, presented and commented. And um, I really um, am uh, thankful for a fair and balanced discussion in our community uh, from the just from the residents. Um, there's always uh, more than one side to uh, uh, you know, um, an item and, and, and various perspectives. So um, I, I hear the concerns from a resident about lowering the 5,000 down to 3,600 now. And uh, to me, I, I I uh, want to echo the uh, housing subcommittee uh, and, and, and their uh, decision uh, to really uh, maximize the number of um, homes uh, that uh, will be um, benefiting uh, during this time of need. Um, to me, at least, I feel really um, somewhat better about um, assisting a, a home that needs um, a lesser amount than a higher amount because uh, the home that uh, can afford the higher amount uh, may have different means of uh, a socioeconomic level. And so um, I would myself personally, I would rather assist uh, those homes, uh, families that um, are living on less means. And so I feel um, very confident about uh, the impact of, of, of of um, helping those that require or less and helping more of those homes and families uh, at the same time. And I, I did hear another comment about, um, related to our, our, our budgeting here about um, it, it tying into defunding our police. I um, encourage uh, residents to continue their engagement with us uh, and always uh, let folks know um, that um, we gladly accept strategies, recommendations, or uh, any plans, or best practices that are out there. And so if, if folks are at home watching, I encourage you to uh, follow up on the meeting. Uh, instead of sending just an email to our 
uh, city clerk for public comment, you're more than welcome to send an email to myself or uh, really uh, any of my colleagues uh, with any uh, solutions uh, and constructive um, criticism. Um, and that's really how we're going to um, accomplish uh, our goals uh, to serve our community. Uh, so next up here, we have Vice Mayor Nunez. So thank you very much. Um, um, you know, one of the things that Sharon, uh, wherever you're at, that struck me is that we have um, two parts that came to us tonight. Um, the one for the small business businesses, and then this one on rent relief. And then we have coming next week, the rest of the CDBG uh, proposal. And I just believe now after listening um, that maybe next year we would be better to sort of put it all together in one piece so persons could see um, how all of the dollars are being recommended to be spent. Um, it allows, uh, I think, um, a better overview uh, because this one doesn't quite uh, share um, some of the things that persons in the community are asking for are really in that third piece that's coming next week. Uh, they can see. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm just thinking that, that maybe next time mm -hmm. we should look at that. Um, one of the, the reasons yeah. Yeah. for the $3,500, as I recall, was uh, some of the renters did need help for the whole monthly rent. They would pay some portion that they only needed assistance uh, for a part of it. So that's why another reason why the, the dollar amount was less. Um, but as I recall, when we first started, uh, we had a dollar amount, and then um, soon after that, or, or maybe not soon, but after that, um, staff came back, said we need additional dollars, here's why, um, and we approved that. So it, in my mind, these um, proposals, and after we vote on them, aren't set in stone. Uh, if staff believes that there's been a change that we need to relook at them, they in the, like they have in the past, can come back and ask for that. At this point, what we're looking at doing is really trying to get through uh, through the end of November, and that's that long not that long of a period of time. But it's realizing what we're spending the dollars on, where we're applying dollars towards rent or support to families and children um, and trying to keep on moving uh, in a direction that is helpful. Um, and I think that uh, I'm relying on staff and the nonprofits that are helping us um, to move us in the right direction. And I have no doubt, uh, and the reason to doubt that's what they're doing. Um, so, I think with the changes that I've heard the, to the $3,600, if that's one, we're removing the pilot and um, just having, um, starting the investigation of the Economic Development Corporation. Those were all things I'm very comfortable with because we're still providing, is it $241,000 towards rent relief between um, now and the end of November. Um, so I believe the city really has committed to uh, assisting um, persons that find themselves in need, not only in rent relief, but in other areas that um, could cause them to find themselves without a roof over their head. Um, and so um, um, could we be doing more? You know, right now we are, I think on, on next Tuesday, you're gonna find out we truly are doing more. So um, I'm, I do like to listen to persons talk about 
what they'd like us to do um, because that's where I get a lot of my ideas. Um, so I'm, I'm fine still with the recommendation with the few changes we've made, knowing that there's more coming in a week. So thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor Nunez. And next up here, Council Member Dominguez. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor and Vice Mayor. Um, I will have to give credit to Council Member Fan. I was listening to his comments and um, I think they were very thoughtful and he definitely um, hit some thought process in at least one council member as I was hearing him talk. And when our partner said that 40% of the families would be affected if we decreased the 5,000 to 3,500, knowing that there is a possibility of, and I, I don't want to <laughs> violate the Brown Act, but it's one of those also conversations that I know is coming next week. I could feel very confident to say that there is a way to increase funding to ensure that we don't have to um, lessen the amount from 5,000 to 3,600. I do believe that there's been some extra funding in that CDBG pot that could help sustain that difference. And if that difference is gonna keep a family housed, I, I, I heard what uh, Councilmember Fan said, and I think there was two points that he made, which was exactly that, where uh, it doesn't seem like a family who, based on some of the comments the vice mayor just made, it doesn't seem like a family is coming in, taking advantage of this program. If they could only pay, they pay what they can and then they ask for the difference. Um, it's just some of those homes, I think there's a couple words now that I'm thinking about that may differ. For example, 3,500 per household. If we look at that chart, that chart may only indicate 23 families or whatever it was. But if you look at the number of individuals, it's over a hundred. That's because there's more than one family living in each household because the rents are so expensive. So sometimes I feel like maybe that per household should say per family unit. Now we did per family unit and you have four family units then you would exceed the 5,000. So that is what's making me feel that maybe because we do trust staff so much that they're, they are doing a good job in allocating that funding. I, I, I hear what the council member said and I, and, I, and I echo his sentiments. I think that our goal should be trying to keep people housed. And if we could do that, it sounds like there is some um, leeway already in it but i i don't feel comfortable enough with just putting a max and a a max a cap amount so i don't know if maybe changing the language may be helpful for maybe from changing from 5000 to 35 maybe just saying 3600 to 5000 that would make me feel a little better and i think in the incoming meeting there will be a way that all of us could figure out if the excess funding is 100,000. We will be able, I think at least for this year, we may be able to, to do that. But I think our priority is to keep our families housed. Um, and we all know that it's gonna get tougher in the next 30 days. And so I would like to ask this committee if we, could um, highlight some of the recommendations that I heard council member fan said, where we just leave the, not change the max amount and maybe just put 3,600 to 5,000 and trust that staff is working with these families to allocate the needing amount. Based on what we've heard from our community concerns and the public comment, and as well as some of the comments from um, 
council member Fander. So that would be my rec my request to change that recommendation. Thank you for your consideration. Well, uh, take a moment here. Well, you know, conversely, uh, if we're looking at it uh, mathematically, uh, the uh, dollar can stretch even further with the, uh, I think, recommended 3600 tonight. If there's a uh, household that has more than one family, and they're under the average or at the average. And by us uh, kind of moving the uh, maximum assistance to the average, we're able to help out more households and those households can have more than one family. And so the principle of the, the limit being adjusted to the average uh, actually can help uh, more uh, family units uh, in some. Uh, next up, Councilmember Montano. Thank you, Mayor Trent. <clears throat> yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. You want to maximize uh, to help more people uh, because we've already run out of money. That's why staff is asking for more money. And, it, and, and, and there are people on the waiting list. So if we reduce it to 3,600, we will be able to help more people stay in their home. It just, it's, it's um, the law of mathematics. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to uh, still recommend uh, change it from 3,500 to 3,600 so we can help more people that uh, out there, more families to stay in their home. And, um, and I'll agree with the changing, you know, all, all the other uh, bullets that I saw on the pilot, take out the word pilot. And, and also um, I wanna make a recommendation for the Economic Development Corporation. Uh, if we can, you can bring that back, uh, Sharon, on the next housing subcommittee, so we could iron out some details and then bring it back to council at uh, uh, another, at our next, well, not next, but whenever it's, uh, it's um, convenient for us to discuss it at city council. Uh, probably after maybe in August, I think that would give us that would give the housing subcommittee and you more time so we can uh, iron out the details. So um, with that, I'd like to make a motion to uh, do, go by staff's recommendations. Do you want to pause it there before we, I, I oh, hear okay. I hear I hear you, uh, but I do want to okay. recognize uh, colleagues here. Uh, uh, I see with the virtual raise hand, Councilmember Fan. Um, so I don't know if we can, um, well, I guess for some context, like when we run out of funding for other things in our budget, the typical process is staff just comes before, uh, the council and requests a, a mid-year, uh, budget um, um, appropriation requests, right? And, and, and so I don't see necessarily why we have to, um, I, well, I guess defund this because um, when, when we can just add more funding to it, um, I mean, this whole process can can exist in a on a rolling basis. Like I I, I, don't, I don't see um, anything that re, um, makes it a hard restriction as to um, you know um, us not being able to uh, keep funding as we go along. Um, and, and and the the other thing is. Um, you know, when um, businesses uh, or, uh, or rather nonprofits come before us, um, they, they have re requested, you know, um, 
waivers, businesses requesting variances and whatnot. Um, I don't know if that's something that we can do. Uh, if we were going to lower that assistance there, uh, but, you know, uh, a family is um, really being affected by that um, lowered amount, if they can request additional assistance, you know, that we don't actually disqualify them, that, um, I don't, or, or, or even uh, on a um, low interest, zero interest um, or loan, um, if it's past that, that 3,500 or any additional assistance there. But, um, you know, I, I'd hate to turn that blind eye there. Um, you know, this council has always been that uh, if we really wanted to fund something, we would. That's, that's really always been the case. We, we would find the funding one way or another. Um, uh, plus we have Walter, you know, that's, um, <laughs> it's our secret weapon. That man can, uh, <laughs> you know, make, um, orange juice out of, uh, lemons. Um, you know, when life give, gives you lemons, um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think that we still have time, um, minimal time, but time nonetheless, uh, before we actually, you know, have to decide on uh, the budget um, and we can always revise it again. You know, if, if um, we see that um, this, um, this maximum threshold um, of, of 5,000 uh, is, is really just, um, it, it's, it's un or it's not doable, right? It, it, if it really is not feasible, we can all always readjust it in the future. But it, it, it seems right now that there's no case to say that there's you know um, like the the five thousand is not feasible because we we have been doing that. Um, and also the case for an economic development corporation, you know, um, you can, you can re get additional funding with your status as an economic development corporation, right? That that's, that's that development part of the economic development. Um, and when we work with uh, our community stakeholders in securing funding for, for programs and, and whatnot. That's something that we've done in the past before. But I think if we have this economic development corporation, we, we have a little bit more leeway to do, I guess, um, in a way, private fundraising for programs like the pilot, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, Four programs like the rent relief program, you know, I I've never, you know, it, it's it's no secret that I've never been really an advocate of rent control. I think, um, but in every uh, time the issue was brought up, my response has always been that um, if we're not going to do rent control, then we uh, have an obligation to still um, make it so that rents are affordable. And that's why I supported the creation of this rent relief program in the first place. You know, if, if uh, the market isn't being controlled, then we can still uh, play a role as government to uh, subsidize rent for those who, you know, have uh, tr trouble. And that has been my position. Um, and, and, and so I am also, um, wary or, uh, mindful of, um, other policies that would, um, be brought up, um, due to, 
um, this inability to uh, completely fund this program. Um, this program has been really um, what I see an emblem of um, government doing its job to provide for 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 folks here and um, and so I uh, those are just my thoughts I I, I really um, want to conclude by saying I believe in Walter um, and uh, his ability to work some magic here. Thank you very much, Councilmember Fan. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think we we all believe in Walter, and uh, you know you're right about um, he, how he can really make a, a sweet a juice from sour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when when sometimes the um, what you get is, is sour and you know, as he, I know Walter you know Walter's listening he's sitting at home listening uh, it's felt in place but um, you know at this you know you know generally speaking I just do want to really support um, where you're coming from with your statements and uh, but you know um, I. I do want to really emphasize that um, we, we, I think we're, you know, my mindset, at least as an individual is things are okay right now as we, um, you know, wrap up the month of June and our, our fiscal year, which we've, I think all performed very well. But I want to really encourage my colleagues, everybody that uh, July one is uh about two weeks away, and our mindset is going to uh, really be switched to austerity, and uh, we find ourselves dipping into our reserves uh, for um, direct impact programs to our community, uh, and um, it is um, a reserve that we've dipped in uh, nearly uh, 25% already um, or closer to it. Uh, and I just uh, look around our nation to see that the uh, pandemic is still taking its toll and we will be uh, faced with uh, one of the deepest uh, depressions in our nation's history uh, in our lifetimes. This will be the toughest uh, depression and economic hardship that we will experience in our lives. And, um, you know, in, in regards to the recommendations, I, I just want to encourage my colleagues to really stretch the dollar at this point uh, as we make policies that will affect uh, not just today, but uh, the months and years going forward, but absolutely the short term uh, years uh, and near uh, months. Uh, and so I, I just wanted to um, encourage folks, uh, my colleagues to do so. And uh, Walter will be in a very tough uh, environment uh, come two weeks from now. Uh, he will uh, have less uh, lemons to work with. Uh, okay, I'm going down the virtual raise hands here, Council Member Montano. Okay, virtual raise hand is down. I don't see. Okay, we're gonna go to Vice Mayor Nunez. Okay, um, I am so Sharon. Um, ultimately, it does not change the total amount. That you're that we're putting into the program, correct? Correct. The three hundred forty-one thousand four hundred dollars. That's the total. Yes, and the funding source um, would be you know, up to your decision okay. for affordable housing fund or CDBG. Okay. So really, what we're talking about, as I see it, um, is. Sometimes that number can could be a thousand dollars, you know. I mean, it depends on what person's 
need for help with their rent. Uh, it's the cap at the top. Um, but the, the total overall cost is not going to change. So with that, uh, Councilman Fan, um, I agree. Um, you made uh, a compelling case. Um, so don't let this, uh, this face that I have on just says that it's 1122 and <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, and my contacts are in and I never keep them on this late. So um, I feel that um, you want to do the most you can for those most in need. So I'd like to move number two and leave it at 5,000. Um, number three, number four, number five. And number six, and Chris, I think number six is you, right? Uh, number six would be uh, working with staff. Staff yeah. all would bring something back for your yeah. discussion. And, and I'd, I've never seen it. I don't know what it looks like now. I don't, uh, so I'm just looking for something that so I know what it is. Um, um, and whatever you think you need to bring back to us, but bring it back in, in, so we, First, know what what we currently do have, and then you've you've listened to all of us, um, and whatever you take from that. But I I would like to know what it looks like now because I have no clue. After hearing all that, the total amount of dollars doesn't increase, just that we leave it at five thousand. Um, and I would like to hear relatively. Uh, whatever point, Sharon, you think we need to hear, as those dollars go out, are we close to running out of dollars? You know, are a person is asking for fewer dollars, or are there more persons? Keep us updated as a council, because what you heard today is what, we, what I heard. Um, are every, every council person I heard, regardless of positions that they took, is that they cared about those individuals that were going to uh, wanted to take part in this program, and they want to make sure the persons had roofs over their heads. So uh, that's my motion. Thank you very much. I, I do want to go to your um, colleague on the housing subcommittee with the virtual raised hand. Uh, I don't want to exclude the comment, Councilmember Montana. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Tran. Um, so, uh, Vice Mayor Nunez, if you can add on the Economic Development Corporation to bring it back to the sub housing subcommittee. Oh, yes, I can do that. So that way uh, we could iron out the details and, and then uh, work with Chris and, and then present it to uh, City Council. And um, I still think 3,600 is, you can reach more families mm -hmm. up and and be aware that um, it is, there's a reset, we're in a recession and we'll have modest means. So uh, I, believe I understand that. that. I understand that. And that's, that's, I just really feel that we should maximize the, um, maximize what the, because uh, the average rent is uh, for a, I think that for a two bedroom or a three bedroom is, is about 3,000 or so. You know, I'm just, I just want to help more families, but. Well, and, um, and, and, I, and I heard that loud and clear. Yeah. Well, let's get, let's get data. But, you know, the next time we bring this back, let's get data yep. from Sharon, as, as we mentioned earlier, we're disaggregate okay. the data and the more information that we can, because I don't think we have enough information, uh, good information tonight, but it's so much deeper. And I think okay. that would benefit us all to, let, let's sure. get the disaggregated data. Sharon, if you can also under this uh, motion. Yep. Uh, bring back, you know, all the data as to, uh, you know, um, not just the average uh, um, you know, assistance okay. number, but also, um, you know, uh, based on, um, you know, uh, how many families are in the household or, or different types of uh, averages. That's a good idea. And, uh, and then also keep in mind that rents are going down uh, because 
uh, that's what I heard in the, the, the uh, from the county because uh, pe some people are moving out. So this this COVID is impacting the rent, True. the apartment the apartment uh, rental. So so anyway, keep, okay. Yeah. I'll second uh, Council uh, Vice Mayor Nunez's uh, motion. Yeah, this is great, absolutely. Uh, and, and so I think it's fine. I think tonight, as we bring it back, as Vice Mayor said, we can adjust as, as needed. And so uh, yeah. I, think, I think we're in a, a really uh, even platform here. Uh, so this is good. And so we do have a motion in a second. I want to check sorry. in with Sharon before I'm sorry, you. Mayor. Yes, uh, can I get a clarification? Sure. Okay, uh, so on number three, um, is it the amount, the total amount, $341,400? Correct. And then the funding source, is it CDBG? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, great. Uh, and when, when will we be receiving this information back? Uh, as for uh, my, my awareness, I'm not, I haven't tracked this a little bit. Uh, uh, so I don't want to speak for the city manager, but usually he says yeah, August. Can you say something, city manager? August. Quiet. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay. okay. That's... Well, I think August has been the popular month um, all night yeah. tonight. So I guess you're going to have a very August. full agenda in August. <laughs> August. <laughs> Not July. Uh, <laughs> okay, great. Fantastic. Right. All right. So we have a motion by Vice Mayor Nunez, and a second by Council Member <laughs> Fan. Virtual vote by Council Member Fan. Aye. Council Member Montano. Aye. Council Member Dominguez. Aye. Vice Mayor Nunez. Aye. Myself is an aye. The motion is carried and the item is approved. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. I know we had a, a hearty a discussion on this item tonight. Chris, did you, was that your voice or? Yeah, I was going to let you guys finish your uh, pleasantries to Sharon and then I have something to chime in about. Okay, yeah. So yeah, just um, uh, thank you very much, Sharon uh, and your team and uh, those on city staff that um, really uh, made this uh, link in sync. Okay, great. Um, we will go to our city attorney. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I um, just wanted to bring something to your attention that was brought to my attention by email from a resident um, and something that is on your agenda in terms of language that I, it, it, it leads me to believe that you, you should probably take additional public comment. So we had some comments that had come in um, asking for certain consent items to be removed so that they could be discussed. Um, and so that additional public comment could come in. Mm. There is language on your consent calendar, which basically indicates that any person desiring to comment in writing on any item on the consent calendar should request to have that item removed from the consent calendar. So my take on that language, and we may look to modify that, is that yes, you had comments come in under public form requesting certain items to be removed so that people could provide additional public comment. Um, and so I would ask that, you know, I'll give you two options. I, I know it's, it is quite late. Um, one option is you could hear those three, I believe there's three items. We can hear those now and have our city clerk confirm what comments did come in. Um, and then if we get any additional comments, um, while those comments are being read on those three items, we can read those at that time. Another option is if council would like to have these three items agendized for your special meeting next week, and I don't know if there's any deadlines here, then I would defer to our city manager. That would be one way to take full public comment at that time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I want to make an attempt to handle business here. Uh, let me check in with our city clerk, Mary Lavelle. How many comments do we have total for those um, consent items that uh, are um, in uh, regards? During the public comment, two persons wrote in emails requesting to have consideration to remove agenda items number six, eight, and 12 from consent. So uh, I can read those again if you'd like, but that was the essence of two comments that you received during public forum. Okay, yeah, so I think that's not too many comments and um, uh, Let's let's try one uh, and 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 see uh, how it goes. So, Chris, we'd have to essentially uh, pull the item. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, one way to do it is is if the council wanted to truly hear the public comment and see if that changes your vote, uh, we could do where you would essentially make a motion to reconsider the three items, and then we'll have staff 
answer any questions that may exist, um, take public comment and see if any other comments roll in during that process. Okay, so I, I wanna make a motion to pull uh, those three items and let's, let's get the comments in and then we'll um, do a good leadership and due Second. diligence for transparency. Okay. Right. Second. What was the motion? Didn't you do the motion? So just to clarify, this would be a motion for reconsideration so that you guys could vote again after hearing the public comment. Okay, so I'll make a motion to pull those three items. Second. Okay, we had a motion. We got a second by Council Member Dominguez. Uh, all in favor of virtual uh, roll call. Council Member Fan. Aye. Council Member Montana. Aye. Council Member Dominguez. Aye. Aye. Ooh. Vice Mayor Dominguez, aye. aye. Myself. Okay, myself, <laughs> myself is an aye. The motion is carried. Let's, let's, let's pull those items out real quick and uh, do our due diligence here. So item number six. Yeah, so. It's about the resolution authorizing application for receipt of local government planning and support grant program funds and approve related budget amendment. So let's go to the comment. Uh, well, the first comment is really a request to remove them from consent. I can read it to you. Okay, well, this is just, uh, just a request. Yeah, sure. This first one is from Lisa Moreno. Good evening, Mayor Tran and City Council. We respectfully request consent items number six and number 12 to be pulled from consent. This is a request on behalf of the Milpitas Parent Coalition. Thank you, Lisa Moreno. The one next one is another email from Jackie Romero of Milpitas. Good evening, Mayor Tran and City Council. We respectfully request consent item number eight to be pulled, removed from consent. This is a request on behalf of the Milpitas Parent Coalition. We are also requesting action to be taken to create a community and city partnership task force to combat our growing unhoused community. There are several leaders from many Milpitas groups that would take part in this mission. We look forward to meeting with you in the near future we are kindly requesting a meeting with city staff in the next 30 days to follow up on this request. Thank you, Jackie Romero, co-founder of Milpitas Parent Coalition. I received a new email that just arrived in the mailbox specifically directed on item number 12. Would you like that read now or do you prefer to go and discuss items number six and eight? Yeah, we'll do one at a time here. I wanna to go to uh, eight first, I think, what type of task force are they proposing? I have to go back to that one, just a moment, please. Okay. We are also requesting action to be taken to create a community and city partnership task force to combat our growing unhoused community. Okay, so we do have the housing subcommittee. We can reply to their email and direct them to that meeting uh, and that body, which I think is a, uh, a full comprehensive subcommittee for their their uh, their goals. Uh, and so um, uh, with that, I think we got comment for number eight. Uh, you know, I think our, our the key part here is to receive the comment and to acknowledge it. And so if eight is cleared, I'd like to uh, motion to approve it. So move. Second. We had a motion by Vice Mayor Nunez and by Council Member Dominguez. Uh, all in favor virtually, uh, Council Member Fenn. Aye. Council Member Montana. Aye. Council Member Dominguez. Aye. Vice Mayor Nunez. Aye. And myself is nine. The motion is carried out number eight. I apologize. No, no, no worry <laughs> about it. Uh, we're having a great meeting here to number six now. Um, we have acknowledged the comment uh, and I will look for a motion. So ask our city clerk, did we get any other additional comment on six? Uh, no, there's one additional comment on 12. Thank you. So move. Second. second. We got a motion by Councilor Montana. We have a second by Councilor Dominguez. All in favor of virtually, Councilor Fan. Aye. Councilor Montana. Aye. Councilor Dominguez. Aye. Vice President Nunez. Aye. Myself is an I. A motion is carried. The item is approved. Down to 12. Um, and now go to Mary here. Is there anything, uh, any further public comment we will uh, gladly acknowledge and accept and welcome? 
Yes, Mayor, there is one comment for okay. agenda item 12. All right. This comment arrives from Tiffany Vuong of Milpitas. The agenda attachments say that more than 600 hours are spent uh, cleaning up homeless encampments. The budget document for the fiscal year of 2020-21 shows that over 500 hours of police work is spent on calls with the homeless. We are wasting money by having the police sweep homeless encampments and then having our public works employees clean up. These sweeps do not do anything. People will just find another place to live. What would be better is providing them with trash services, safe needle disposal, safe parking, et cetera. We need to address the underlying social issues, sometimes drug addiction and mental illness, but the root causes always involve the growing economic inequalities across the country and housing unaffordability. Let's utilize the housing first model, which houses people first and then helps them with their other problems. Let's build supportive housing where formerly unhoused people can get service in-house. Thank you very much, Mary. And, um, you know, I really appreciate the public comments about, you know, and this is the exact comments that we look for uh, in our line of duty uh, solutions. And you can never have too many uh, proposed um, solutions to the great concerns um, facing our community and communities throughout our region. I, um, I'm glad that uh, we recently continue to support 355 Sango Court uh, and uh, to, to house is, is certainly uh, a time, um, really a, a time uh, demand effort. And, and, and we've been pushing forward and I hope that um, that is one solution that has been worked on that is uh, truly really um, a um, physical or uh, kind of um, solid uh, type of, of solution. And uh, I think that um, at the same time, we, we should really, if you're out there listening, Tiffany, um, you know, we have to ensure the public health of our city and, and the public safety. And, and sometimes uh, we are really at a need, I think this item 12 is really a need for our community to ensure uh, a place that um, is not only um, um, safe uh, with uh, public health, but also public safety uh, and ensuring that um, um, things are uh, monitored um, appropriately. So um, if anybody else has a comment on 12, uh, that'll be great. Uh, Vice Mayor. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that I think the, uh, if you could direct that um, comment also to the housing subcommittee, um, there's a segment in their section that I think we could deal with um, because we do have to address it, uh, as you said, Mayor. Um, so other than that, I was just ready to move the item. Okay, fantastic. I do want to go to the virtual raise hands uh, as well. Uh, Council Member Dominguez. Um, thank you so much, Mayor. Um, I do want to just thank the community for pulling this item. I know that sometimes, honestly, we're humans too. And once it gets to that 1130 stage, we start getting a little tired. So we definitely depend on you for, for things like this. And I do have some notes on this item. Um, I do understand the purpose of this is to ensure that our police department stay safe as they clean up the encampments but one of the things that I have learned is that um, in my work in 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 the different city during my day job cleaning the encampments in itself just doesn't help and so it is a reoccurring issue and so I do see we're, we're spending at least 600,000 um, within now in 2025 so I, I definitely thank the subcommittee uh, for taking this on um, I don't know if there's a way, do we, is this contract a set contract until 2025 or is this a contract that we could do yearly? Cause I know that's something that 
the other cities have done um, just to look at the prior year to see what the cost was. And then maybe we could have um, some of that savings go into making programs so we could work as a wraparound service and not just a cleanup service because what happens when you clean up an encampment, it comes right back. Um, and so that is one of the things I have learned. <laughs> um, and so I don't know, maybe someone, I'm looking at the contract, but I don't see, I don't know if we could do it yearly. And then that way the subcommittee has some funding to play with, to come up with solutions because we're, we're making walk with Walter do a lot of magic out of lemons, but <laughs> <laughs> I definitely don't want to set out the council member uh, Montano and the vice mayor to, to not have anything to implement with. So just wondering if that's a possibility. Councilmember Dominguez, uh, I can answer the question at least with regard to the contract, and then I'll defer to our finance uh, director, our purchasing staff, um, in terms of the RFP. But the agreement itself is written to be a five-year agreement. Um, the only question I would have for finance staff is whether the RFP itself somehow tied the city's hands where it had to be a five-year agreement. I don't believe so. It's Walter Austin, finance director. Um, Besides, we do have a termination for convenience clause in the contract if we need to terminate it earlier. Okay, perfect. So I just want to clarify that if the subcommittee decided to maybe try an amazing pilot program and they would have access to maybe some of that funding if they wish to, uh, we could go ahead and terminate that contract after the year. That is correct. Whenever. There is also Sounds I think. Like that is correct. Also, I think the way, um, yes, we can always do that. We can also just give us authorization to award the contract for one year, and we can come back for subsequent years if it's the council's desire. Yeah, I would feel a lot more comfortable doing that if, if the council would be okay with that, just because the needs, I've seen contracts like this, and then what happens is the city gets stuck, and then they still have the same issue with no solution, and I I know that this council has grown a lot together and I, I have a lot of faith in the subcommittee. I know you guys have done amazing work. So I just wanna make sure you have some funding as well, if that's a possibility. So I would um, kindly ask for maybe asking uh, the direction to move the contract to a year to year basis and then move this request over to the subcommittee um, to bring back to the council for further recommendations. Thank you for your time and consideration. I, I appreciate uh, your uh, recommendation, Council Member Dominguez. Uh, um, like most, and if not all contracts that we have, uh, this is a, a authorization for uh, city government to um, have a um, limit as to the need for this type of service in particular. Uh, this is an amount not to exceed, and so it is conceivable uh, that uh, we will not spend upwards to uh, the number listed on the agenda. Uh, now, uh, the investment of funds here, uh, or the possible investment of funds to the limit, uh, really is a, a course of action that will really offset the cost to other departments uh, and free up time as well. And so I, I, I am uh, really stout on uh, supporting the agenda item as is, uh, and that's with input from the community as well on some of the areas of our community that uh, pose a risk to our public safety of the children and the families. Uh, it is uh, correct uh, what you uh, have stated in terms of the encampments and how they um, uh, may be uh, cleared up appropriately and legally uh, to have it come back and uh, be uh, possibly referred again as a um, risk. Uh, but at the same time, it's uh, very much um, important that we maintain our, our service here uh, as uh, if we don't uh, clear, uh, take care of the leaves, uh, the leaves will continue to pile uh, and, and it was is not beneficial to uh, the community and that includes everybody, including uh, the uh, folks that are unsheltered. Uh, we do wanna provide um, 
public spaces that are uh, ones that do not harm those who are most vulnerable. Uh, next up here, Council Member Montana. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Tran. Um, now I was just going to uh, also um, uh, recommend that to bring it to the Housing Subcommittee, but, uh, but and I'm glad that uh, Vice Mayor had suggested that. Um, you know, the, and I also want to make a comment. The, the Water District, I serve on the Safe Clean Creeks Committee and uh, Many of our creeks are um, uh, polluted, and what they what they and 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 Councilmember Dominguez knows is that they clean up. They have the city, a social worker, uh, the water district, all the team. They go in there. They give they put a notice uh, that their encampment will be cleaned up. I think they give them a week, possibly, and so they go in there and they clean it up. And then they come back in another week. So it's like a revolving door. <laughs> so uh, imagine the money. And from my understanding, the water district had uh, so much money allocated for 15 years. Well, they've only, they, they will only do it for that 15 year budget is gone already. They, don't, they were only able to do, to do uh, two years of work. So this is a, a big problem. And then also another thing I want to men mention is a lot of homeless don't want to be housed. They're, they're mental, some of them are mentally ill and they want to be living out, out, in, the, out, in, the, out in the environment. Probably. So uh, just, consider, just remember that. And you probably know this as well uh, since you're a social worker, uh, former social worker mayor. But yeah, a lot of them don't want to be housed. So that's another challenge. And then the mental illness part too. So. Yeah, there's a big but I'm glad we're bringing it to the housing subcommittee and uh, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up at the virtual raised hand, I do see our city clerk, Mary Lavelle. Uh, Mayor, one more comment has arrived on this sure, item. Yeah. I don't know if you'd like to have me read that. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Okay, next comment in number 12 is from Allison McDonald. It says, I sent this earlier, but it wasn't read. I am shocked that the city is considering spending up to $1 million mm -hmm. on homeless encampment cleanup services while only spending $340,400 on rental assistance to prevent homelessness. Our police estimate 1,000 contacts with unhoused people in our community. We need to get people off the streets and into supportive housing with access to services, then they won't need the police. We also increased the police budget by $2 million this year. Let's put some of this toward towards support services and assistance instead. And thank you very much, Mary. And thank you very much, Allison. I'm just sticking with us. I know you're watching right now from Sunny Hills, California. Um, I, I appreciate your comment. And um, I, I think, do think that you're, the number you have for the total maximum compensation uh, the amount, um, an annual amount, and, but it is not a million dollars. Uh, and, um, it's also hard to compare, uh, you know, apples to oranges. These are two different functions uh, to keep our community um, uh, where the um, community um, is, is best positioned. Uh, and so um, uh, we, we do not a lack of other areas uh, to have a, a comprehensive approach to um, the really the most complicated issue in our community in our valley, which is homelessness for the unsheltered. And so and we'll continue to um, make gains in the lanes that uh, we, we can find, I believe. Okay, you on now to uh, council member doing this. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, Again, I'm looking at the recommendation and it says per vendor and that's a hundred, half a million. So it's 500,000. So that's, that's a lot of, I understand the cleanup, but again, it's a, it's going to be a continuous cycle of spending money. If we don't have the wraparound services to get these folks some help. So I, I definitely agree that Milpitas needs to be cleaned up and we need to, I just, 
based on my experience again with my day job, um, I've seen some numbers and that's less than 150. It should take less than 150,000 to clean up an area. The city of Milpitas does not have these big size encampments that I have seen that take hundreds and thousands of dollars a year. I, I do believe um, that 100,000 uh, for the first year and again, it's it's going back to that conversation of they could all, staff could always come back to council and say, hey, you know what? We're having some issues with these cleanups. They're more expensive. This is what it's costing. I would feel more comfortable having giving allocating a hundred thousand for a vendor. And I understand there's different vendors that do different things. Um, and then having this come back to us and maybe implementing at the same time a wraparound service that could take some of this money. I just don't feel that allocating all 500,000 until the year of 2025, that's a, that's a really long time from now. So I feel that we could maximize, again, it's maximizing that tax dollar. I know we have all seen the increase in our unhoused population and those emails are coming in and, um, Cleanups do not work on their own. Um, you need wraparound services. If not, we're literally going to become cleaning a dump like everyone else's dump. And I also want to clarify that what happens with these unhoused uh, communities is that not all the time it's the unhoused creating the mess. What happens is a lot of times other people see the mess and then they'll come and dump their stuff. And it may not even be Mopetians. I've seen it in the city that I work with, other people from other cities come and they dump in these sites. And so then your bill turns bigger where we could have just helped somehow bring wraparound services and clean up the cycle in the first place. And the money is there. I mean, I'm seeing 500,000 um, until 2025. I just, I don't feel comfortable. Um, I feel comfortable with doing 100,000 and then staff coming back to us if the need exceeds that, I just don't see the number of, um, I don't see the number of sites needing that money. So I, at this time, if, if it's more than a hundred thousand, I don't believe cleaning up an encampment on its own. I don't want to give an, an, um, a task to this committee, setting them up for, for creating more, what was it? Creating orange juice with lemonades. Like I, I don't want to do that to them. And so I kindly ask that we just take baby steps on this approach. We, we don't have to give them a contract till 2025. We could just do a little bit at a time, come back and maybe give the subcommittee the ability to figure that out with that funding. If we start seeing the bill go up and the cleaning of encampments um, happen, then come back to us. And at that point, I, I would definitely support it. But I can't support it based on what I know and what I work every single day and seeing what we have in Milpitas, it's not excessive. It's still controllable if we do wraparound services. So that that would be, I know it's getting late, so I'm just gonna wrap it up with that. Thank you all for listening and um, for your consideration. Thank you. Yeah, I think appreciate your uh, focus on uh, city of Milpitas. And um, let me go to our public works director, Tony Enda for really the inside scoop. Uh, maybe you can shine some uh, new uh, perspectives on, uh, you know, where uh, the work is on the ground, Tony. Certainly, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, and good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members. Let me start by lowering my hand. Um, so I'm, I'm taking my cues from you all here. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, so um, a great discussion here, and I'm glad we're having this topic here because it's the staff and public works that are involved with the cleanups when it does require. So we do work with our police department to um, provide the proper notices and our housing group as well to provide resources to the, to the um, unhoused folks. But it's the public works staff that really are the ones going out there and having to deal with doing the actual cleanup. And they are the ones who are um, having to deal with sometimes unsightly items as well, which is like needles and other things like that, which are harmful um, to their health, which is why we're bringing this contract forward. Um, these monies are monies that were being spent anyways uh, with our staff doing, we're just looking to provide a little bit of protection to them. Um, the one thing I did want to clear up is that um, what we're looking at here are not to exceed contracts. So 
Uh, when you look at the number there that says 100,000 um, per contractor per year, that's not a check written for 100,000 for that contract. That's just to say, we're gonna start this thing off here and we're gonna set aside for the first year, for example, 100,000, we're gonna give it a go. And like we do with every budget item that we have every single year, we're gonna go, we'll go one year in and then we're gonna come back later on and during our budget process, we can have some data lined up to say, council last year, we spent X amount of dollars, say $50,000 on homeless encampments. So we're gonna go ahead and budget 50,000 this, this, this year, even though our contract itself gives an allotment of up to 100,000, we can come back every single fiscal year and actually ask for an amount based on actual data that we have on the ground. We've never done this before. So what we have in place right now is a not to exceed. So I, I just wanna make sure folks, when folks look at this agenda item here, they don't look at it and think the city is out there dishing out $500,000 per contractor. We're just putting a number in place. And as we get better at documenting the, the value of the work that we're doing, we'll be able to come back every single fiscal year during the budget process, work with council, looking at every budget need that's available, that's offered in the city to know what a dollar amount we actually put towards this. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up too was the find the uh, mechanism that we went with the RFP. So the great thing about the uh, working with our finance department, the procurement staff, and what they did here was, what we have here is an RFP that was put out for five years. What we have uh, done is we've locked in pricing for a five-year period, which is very good. That gives us some predictability in how we budget going forward. So as years and years go by, the pricing that they have set up is based on what they are to put in place in RFP. So we don't come year after year with not knowing what they're gonna bill us later on. So I just wanna provide those points of clarification and hope that helps um, uh, ease folks' mind on the amount of money that's gonna be spent um, each fiscal year. Thank you very much for the insight, Tony. Thank I you, Tony, for that. I, I, you know, I think the locking in the, 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 the cost and, um, and you know the amount not to exceed, which we um, are accustomed <laughs> to uh, from day one, and how we do business in town. But most most pressingly to me is our our, our city employees, our teammates, our our, mil, our our family members in the city government. I, I don't want them to be away from our, our neighborhoods and upkeeping our neighborhoods, and then having them in areas where they're not experts, where there's a danger. To, to their 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 foot, uh, a danger to their hand, a danger to their arm, um, possibly being around hazardous material, uh, the unknown, uh, and uh, to possibly have our city employee maintenance workers to be in a high risk environment where where they require the police as well in, in drawing their abilities uh, to a place where they're not safe. And I think that is, is really a key place where we have to really look. And I, by having this uh, agenda item, I think that we can prevent uh, danger to someone in an environment that are challenging. As we know, a lot of encampments are in areas where they're secluded or uh, near a highway possibly, or just there's just a whole dynamic where they would even require police and to, to have a specialized professional come in um, to a, an amount not to exceed a low amount, hopefully. I think that's just a reasonable request I'd like to, you know, really advocate for tonight. And um, I'm seeing the city clerk here with the discussion, do we have any public comment? Uh, if there's someone that's already commented on the item, uh, they have been provided their equal opportunity. But if there's someone that hasn't commented, would love to hear from them before we go to council member Fan. There are several more comments. I believe there's four or five here, Mayor. So let me um, read those to you. Thanks for tuning in folks. So Allison, you already heard from, okay. Here's a comment from Jackie Romero. Please allow presentation so public can understand the purpose of the $1 million, the contract to care for our parks is a great representation with what happens with contractors. They do not have the pride that our public works provides. 
Next comment is from Charles Schletzbaum, 1775 Millmont. This money would be better spent on a tiny house community with Habitat for Humanity like San Jose did. There's an additional comment from Jackie Romero, but I just earlier read one from yes, her, please, so I'll go to the next on. one. That's the rules, okay. Next comment is from Irvish Kumar Mehta with a PO box address in Milpitas. Two Milpitas City Council members. I would like Milpitas City Council members to consider multiple vendors consideration for service on landscaping management and evaluate the service contract based upon the length of service provided to city. Also funding allocations to service vendors based on specific service criteria would help city assign the contract accordingly and collect the analysis of service contract. Thanks, Urbish Mehta. There's another comment again from Jackie Romero. So uh, I already yeah. read one from her. Hey, Jackie, you know, I think you're well aware each person only gets one comment. And tonight we're doing three minutes, not one, not two, but three minutes. And I hope that will suffice, uh, not just for you, but for everybody. And Really, we never go past three minutes each person, but I appreciate your repeated uh, emails. But but uh, I think, as you know, each person, uh, one comment, and that's just it been going back, I think, 66 years. So, Mary, I think you got one, one more. more. Yeah. yeah. An additional comment here is from Lisa Moreno. The contract to care for our parks is a great representation with what happens with contractors they do not have the pride that our public works provides. We need a viable solution that helps house our homeless, not push them out and clean up routines. Public works and parks crew used to clean our parks and those items were there too. Let's look at the whole picture. Thank you for your time. Our members all left this meeting long ago. Thank you very much, Lisa. I appreciate you. And uh, I think you're doing very well in the pines. We're trying to keep the whole city um, at a quality of life that you'd expect, just like in the Pines. And, you know, I think from what I've been hearing, I, I am, you know, I, I really want to now see the presentation because I think that would help out our community members as to what the agenda item is. And also myself and, you know, I think my colleagues, everybody, uh, you know, let, let's get some more information on this because I know there's a lot of passion for this item. So, um, let's go to Council Member Fan for the virtual raised hand, and and then if Tony, if we can get the presentation, um, then you know I, I think that would help me too as well. So Council Member Fan, um, just seeing how um, it's past midnight, um, and there are uh, appears to be um, a a desire for more discussion on this item. Um, I, I don't know uh, if maybe it's best for us to uh, just continue this item um, onto the next meeting um, where we can um, have a more substantive uh, conversation uh, on. So, um, I mean, if um, that's something that um, the council wants to do, um, you know, we we can do that. Um, but if if not, I I do have a number of questions that um, you know I, I want to ask on on this item. I think you got a good point, Councilmember Fan, and I think there's a couple ways to look at it. You know, this was agendized for tonight, and we can agendize it for the next meeting and get more public comment at the next meeting. Uh, but I feel like uh, we've already we've we're on a kind of a, a roll here. And we, we can accomplish this item tonight, possibly, but with the presentation. But if, if we, if, we uh, if, if, if the uh, council here would like to move it forward to the next week, uh, if the city manager thinks it, it'll fit in next week, uh, then we can, you know, open it up further and do more public comments and, and really get more engagement, which is fine with me, but um, it's, it's really a direction of the council tonight. And, um, so let's go to Steve here, our city manager. Um, we can we can fit this in next week too, or we can fit it in next week. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. 
Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for folks that are tuning in past midnight. Appreciate you. Uh, we're going to continue the discussion for this next week. Hope that's okay with you uh, over in Sunny Hills and the Pines, folks. All right. Well, with that being said, um, really proud of the, the council tonight. Uh, I think we, we had another great meeting. Um, and it's, it's been certainly a, a challenging time period in our, in our public service. Uh, I do want to recognize the participants uh, for being a part of the meeting as well. I hope uh, those that uh, weren't able to provide, uh, or let me, let me backtrack a little bit here. I hope those that uh, uh, we didn't hear from but are on the call on the meeting uh, enjoyed it uh, as much as we did. Uh, I want to thank, uh, I'm going down the list here of folks that uh, didn't speak, but we know you're here. Uh, Chief Corpus, uh, uh, Mr. Steve Erickson and uh, let's see here, uh, Chief Sherrard to see there, uh, Liz Brown, Ned, uh, and Renee. Yeah, thank you for uh, being a part of this meeting. I want to recognize everybody. Uh, I do want to adjourn um, tonight's meeting um, in memory of uh, George Floyd and all those that have been. Uh, unjustly uh, attacked, <laughs> murdered, um, and, and lost their lives and, and due to, um, you know, crimes yep. and so, and brutality. And, and I think uh, we can all commit tonight, everybody that's listening to making the world a better place. And uh, we can do that here in our virtual chamber and really city hall as it stands and I know we're all committed to uh, bringing forward um, uh, a better tomorrow. And so I wanna thank everybody for, um, for putting their heart into that. And, and so let's have a really, if you can uh, turn off your um, uh, video so that your screen is black, uh, we can um, have a moment of silence uh, before we adjourn this meeting uh, in honor of those um, that have lost their lives unjustly. And um, you can black out our screens. Um, if you like, I guess, I'm not gonna uh, require it, but this is uh, a moment here. This meeting is adjourned. Have a uh, 